Good morning, everyone, and good, uh, good evening for the folks who are joining from India. Uh, my name is Dr. Sridhar Reddy Kosapati. I'm currently serving as a NATA president. I uh, live in Dallas, and uh, NATA started like 12 years back with the motto of Samskutika, Vikasame Nata Mata, Samaja Seve Nata Bata, Aneoka, Concept 30. 12 years back, our Emeritus uh, Chair, Dr. Premier Edgar Ashad Adurevlo, is Samasta Sapin Zabudindi. Then, I am the current President of the Today, May 15th, we have a Star Wars. Dr. Lander Goda Mark Sarnata Tarpunyan. Namaskara Daniwala. This Karikaman Ki Mukenga Apna Foundation Sojanato, Api Varasa Karantoman, Vida Dr. Ni Walevari Vaka, Visista Sevalu, or Visista, and they were professions loan at twenty. We with the Rangalo or Paruna to a doctor look, Varivari, Seval Nimaku, Angistan of the Mark Saranata Tarpuna, Daniel Tunam, Alaga post to Covid Taravata, and the community law, particularly the Pravasa on the loop, Pravasa Indian Sue, they are all going through a lot of emotions and also post Covid syndromes. They are all, we have seen that with your help, with your lectures, with your presentations, hope some of those concerns can be were heard and resolved and beneficial to our Telugu community. Yerozu yeh kari kermaan kuchche sna ma doctor Sandar Goda yeh daniyal tripto nano andalu doctor Bawa ready garu Bawa nandar ready garu doctor Sangeeta ready garu even she has been off the way bit la between India and US and participating in this seminar. Thank you very much, ma'am. And doctor Sanjeev Reddy, particularly doctor Adishesh Reddy who actually initiated this uh, effort. Uh, Dr. Rajesh Aridi is Apna Foundation and also working with the API. Dr. Ravi Kolli, Dr. Rupama, Dr. Mohan Mallam, Dr. Nas, Dr. Kishore, Dr. Jag Jagannath, Dr. Padma Jagaru, Dr. Swarna, Dr. Pad Prasad Garimella, Satya Sriram Garu, Alage Yoka Web Seminar. Sorry, Dr. Praveen Garu, plus Alagi Yoka Web Seminar, technical Gagani, behind Dundi, my Nata Web Seminar, Sakarin Chirana, Sahasara, Sodalu, Mithulu, Mariu, my committee members, and at twenty Dr. Allah, sorry, Haram Redigaru, Dr. Subar Redigaru, Mariu Naran Reddy is our treasure. And thank you very much. Now I am giving over to the Dr. Adisheshari. Thank you very much. You are on mute, Andy, Doctor. I should shut the Yeah, okay. go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I can't match uh, Sridhar's eloquence in Telugu, but I'll I'll speak in English. I'm very very excited to welcome all. He's on mute. I, I don't know what's happening. I, I was. Yeah, on mute. Uh, okay, now you're okay. You're good. Yeah, go ahead. You're good. Yeah, okay. I hope it is good for a while. Um, I'm very excited to welcome you all to this uh, webinar on with this distinguished top class speakers. In his recent, recent motivational speaker, you know, in his recent book, motivational speaker Tony Robbins says that you should be the CEO of your own health. It doesn't matter what your profession is, whether you're a doctor or a professor or a computer expert or rocket scientist. You should be proactive with your own health. And we hope this webinar helps you to shape your personal health, healthcare strategy. So, so that, that's what our motive and hopefully we'll accomplish that at least to some extent. And this weekend has been hectic for me with my daughter graduating from UAB School of Medicine yesterday and could not devote as much time as I wanted to, but I'm quite happy with this wonderful cast of doctors supporting me in this endeavor, and also the computer professionals, uh, Dr. Allah, uh, Sri Allah Ramredigaru, and Dr. Uh, I mean, Sri Subaredigaru Mekha Garu, and uh, Sri Gandra Narayan Redigaru, and Sri Dharkorsupadi Garu to support in this uh, effort. And I'm sure this will go smoothly. Without, without non-doctors, this program would not have been a success. So I really appreciate them. So 
without any further delay let me introduce our uh, i have a dual actually i have a dual role one i am a uh, chairman of advisory council of nata and also i am involved with apna foundation so with that so apna and nata jointly did this end over with the blessing of api so i am going to introduce Uh, the president past president and chairman of advisory council of nata dr mohan mallam to introduce the first speakers dr sangeeta reddy and dr satya sriram uh, mohan please take over okay dear yeah, sir reddy good morning good evening everybody you know thanks to all the speakers uh, you know instead of spending your uh, time with your family on a sunday you are uh, doing some community service now that is really a you know applaudable uh, event and we uh, <clears throat> you know before i introduce uh, them first of all let me thank dr arsh sharadigaru for uh, thinking about this topic timely topic now we are seeing the light at the end of the tunnel and uh, dr arsh sharadi came up with this uh, topic and uh, you know he gathered the speakers and coordinated i spent a lot of time on this and also the technical brains behind this today's uh, event you know ram reddy narayan reddy and subbaredy and others who you know, really on behalf of the nata as a former chair of the advisory council and current member of the advisory council of nata i thank all of them for the time and uh, <clears throat> we have a beautiful uh, schedule today and the first speaker is uh, dr <clears throat> sangeeta edigaru actually dr sangeeta reddy or does not need any introduction everybody knows her now she is the ceo of the apollo hospitals and in spite of her uh, busy schedule you know, she was able to join uh, us uh, for a few minutes and uh, after that i think dr satya sriram garu is going to <coughs> give the actual uh, presentation and uh, i'll let uh, dr sangeeta reddy or uh, say a few words and then we'll, uh, i will get on to dr satya sriram Sangeeta Reddygar, you want to say a few words? Okay. Namaste, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. It's a pleasure to connect with all of you. The Indian community across the world is doing so much to elevate uh, the overall status of India, and uh, you serve in whichever area or whichever community you belong. So let me begin by congratulating you, and especially congratulating the uh, North American Telugu Association Dr. Prem Sagar Reddy is also very well known to our family, and it's a pleasure to see all of you. So many friends, uh, Dr. Adi Shesha Reddy, Dr. Mohan Malam, many many of you, Dr. Anupama, Dr. Prasad, underu chala baga telshna valu under ki namaskar valu. Meeru, this program just then just then andku maaku chala santosham gundi because Dr. Reddy, my father, uh, continues to say. that it is most important for us to focus on staying healthy and preventive health so at apollo we're trying to commit that as much as we do in curing high end care you know cardiac bypass and transplants etc we put an equal emphasis or focus on preventive health care and keeping people healthy and this is a holistic view of health including uh, you know ayurveda and yoga and a very holistic view so dr satya will be speaking more about this but i just want to uh, say one last line and that is that the stress that the world has undergone in the last two years because of covid uh, has been unprecedented but there is hope because even in that difficult time we found cures we came out of it we figured out how to create new protocols we collaborated globally we used technology and we have found that the human race or mankind is actually capable of overcoming many obstacles the big obstacle in front of us now is not really the underlying pandemic of uh, covid but really the endemic situation of non communicable disease of which cardiac stroke and and stress is one of the big factors and its manifestations uh you know from uh, sleep apnea to uh, all kinds of personality tensions are being manifested because of the quality of life and the tensions of everyday life so our ability to really like was beautifully said be ceos of our own health find ways to manage our health including the stress 
and uh, the entire environment, I think is really the key to future happiness. I also recently attended Peter Diamantes of Singular, uh, Singularity University of Abundance 360. And his hypothesis is really that all of us have the potential to really live beyond 100 or 120 because of the advances that science is making today. But it's in our hands to live those years healthy and happy. And so with this, I'm going to wish all of you a healthy life. And I'm going to hand over to my colleague, uh, Satya Sriram, who is the CEO of our Preventive Health Division. Uh, my congratulations and best wishes to all of you. Namaskar. Thank you. Thank you very Satya, much. Satya, over to you. OK, yeah. Before she starts speaking, thank uh, you, <clears throat> I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Satya Sriram, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the, at the Apollo Hospitals. And as a part of her role, you know, she's uh, promoting the Apollo Pro Health by different means. And she was with the McKinsey and Company, a management consulting company for 10 years, where she worked extensively with the hospitals, health insurances, and the pharmaceutical industries, as well as the public and social sector in India, Southeast Asia, and the USA. In her most recent role, she was the director of the strategic initiatives helping chart out their five-year strategy, setting up new consulting delivery models and people, initiate, initiate, people initiatives for McKinsey in India. She was also instrumental in setting up a research-based do tank, McKinsey Center for Government in Singapore that specialized in understanding and disseminating best practices followed by governments globally. In addition, from year 2015 to 2019, she led the strategy and marketing for the Hindu group based in Chennai. During her tenure with the group, she built new revenue streams in digital content subscription, as well as a consumer insights and marketing solutions advisory business. Satya has a PhD in neuroscience from John Hopkins University, and she brings her understanding of the brain to developing insights about the way consumers behave and respond. She also highlights the underlying neurophysiology of leadership behaviors and mindsets to coach students and women at the workplace. So here is Dr. Satya Siram. It is your turn, Dr. Satya Garu. Namaste. Thank you so much for that very well, kind introduction. Satya Garu, can uh, I just do, as a moderator, Please. I need to be, uh, is it 20 minutes possible? 20 minutes, uh, OK. Absolutely possible. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And it's a delight to be here. Um, COVID was actually a very, very difficult and tough time for all of us across the world. Uh, but the one big takeaway for everyone collectively is that we absolutely must proactively think about our health. The life expectancy in the turn of the last century, 1900, was uh, 32 years old, but now it is 71. And as Dr. Farida mentioned, it is going to uh, hit 100 and further in our own lifetime. We will all live longer as a society, but the opportunity is in how we are going to live our lives. The quality of our life in the future will depend on what we do today. And the critical first step for all of this is to ensure that we actually take a much more modern definition of health. Health is not just the presence or absence of disease. It is essentially how we feel, how we function, how we um, relate to one another, how we work and how we actually live our lives. At Apollo, one of the things that we actually think about is six pillars of preventive health. Very much the first one is what we put inside our bodies not just what items, but in what proportion, having a balanced diet, controlling our portions to ensure that the right amount of the right fruits and vegetables, carbs and proteins, including water and cutting out the sugar is, is a critical first pillar. Physical activity, exercise, uh, at least 150 minutes a week, ideally, uh, making sure that we are not sitting especially in front of our screens and at our desks all the time, having much more movement. And thirdly, flexibility and muscle strength. 
our musculoskeletal health is directly correlated with the quality of our life as well as the longevity. And I don't think as a group we pay enough attention to that aspect. So thinking about our muscle strength and flexibility is another important angle. Sleep, sleep cycle, we're all aware, six to eight hours, but also impacts our body metabolism as well as our mind health. And so it is interconnected in an important dimension of what we need to think about and take cognizance of. Our mind health, as uh, in, this, in this day and age, we have actually, uh, I mean, exposed to about 32 GB of information um, every single day. That's how much our brain needs to actually process and file away and organize the most important aspects and discard what we don't think is important. We need to give the brain the space, the time to declutter, to be able to actually be positive and be able to embrace what we need to do. Another dimension is social connectedness. What we're doing here today, what we do with our families and friends and at our workplace, how connected we are rather than be as individuals um, is a very, very important of our holistic health. And finally, when we do need to take medicines, it is critical to adhere to it. There is studies that show that uh, people tend to start medications, but sometimes as soon as three weeks the adherence to actually taking medications at the right time goes away. Collectively, all of this is essentially what we think about as holistic health and important for us to think about our own, but also our near and dear ones. We all own um, vehicles, some more expensive ones than others. Each vehicle has on average about 30,000 parts and we are exceptionally diligent about servicing our vehicles annually. But we don't think about our body as, as well, right? Our body is often left unserviced for many years at a time. And uh, while we are very well aware of this fact, it is really hard and often deprioritized for us to actually proactively think about what, where, where our current health is and what we need to do about it. Why, we, why are we not taking it as, as seriously? At least our hypothesis is as a sandwich generation between taking care of our children, the next generation, and being responsible, dutiful children to our parents, as well as the community at large. And in that process, also pursuing professional pursuits we often forget and deprioritize our own health. But we don't deprioritize our retirement fund. We don't deprioritize our children's education fund. But we do tend to deprioritize our health. After thinking about what, therefore, why we do that, and what we need to do to change our own behaviors, um, we actually arrived on three important areas that we need to focus on as a Bono to really push preventive health and make it uh, realistic uh, for people to adapt uh, their lifestyles. The first is making the health itself tangible. Often it goes unnoticed until there is a pain or a symptom that is something tangible. Then we actually do make the time to go see a doctor or to go get the diagnostic tests we need. But un can we make that health underlying health even more tangible even earlier. The second is um, Indian population risks. Genetically, we are different from Caucasian populations. This is well proven. There are many studies. Um, how are we ensuring that the um, risk scores that we have, that the uh, interventions that we do are tailored to Indian population? Um, risks itself, especially as we think about cardiac risk that is uh, increasingly uh, targeting people that is much younger, between 30 and 50 year olds, um, and far younger than Caucasian populations. <laughs> and how do we then ensure that once we understand these things, we help people make behavioral changes to their habits itself and shift to healthier lifestyles that are sustainable? So one of the first things in order to make the health tangible, we are actually using mixed reality 
to um, find a way to help you understand what is going on in your in your heart itself. In a partnership with Microsoft, um, along with a artificial intelligence enabled cardiac risk score, we take your vitals and um, get a few questions answered and then uh, make um, your health come alive in a mixed reality world uh, when you wear a Holo Microsoft HoloLens. Show what your modifiable risk contributors are for the most common non-communicable conditions, the blood pressure, diabetes, and so forth, and show you what is going on inside your arteries, what could go wrong if you do not take cognizance of this and do not act. Um, and on the flip side, what could actually happen if you do shift your lifestyles um, to, to healthier diets and active physical um, exercise and so forth. The other thing we've done is actually transform the more traditional um, health check. Um, we, we wanted to go beyond a set of diagnostic blood tests and imaging tests to truly take a more holistic evaluation of, uh, of your current health status, including mind health, including sleep, as well as um, the musculoskeletal health. The first step to that is actually understanding your own risks. So we um, have devised a health risk assessment that takes into account your medical and family history, also the lifestyle choices that you have made. Using a prescriptive algorithm, recommend based on your risk, what personalized tests you need to be doing on a regular basis. The second step from that is actually the diagnostic evaluation itself, multi-organs, including the mind, including musculoskeletal, and then to be able to have a conversation with the doctor to understand what areas um, you need to focus on and how one can actually get healthier. We call this the path to wellness. Before we do that, we actually um, have developed uh, several risk scores that are on Indian population risks. Um, thanks to the, uh, the privilege of having um, data of uh, individuals across their lifespan, we've been able to develop cardiac risk scores that predict the risk of a cardiac event within seven to 10 years, your risk of having pre-diabetes within three years, as well as your risk of acute exacerbation of asthma that is connected with the air pollution index of the city that you are living in, and be able to predict these future health events for you and combine that as part of your evaluation. And finally, based on the doctor recommendations, your current risk health, uh, risk, uh, risks as well as um, uh, your current health status, we develop a path to wellness and ensure that one stays on this track through a series of messages, an app, as well as calls with health mentors to enable a nudge-based care continuum. We've seen over the last year with over 100,000 people going through this program, actual clinical outcomes in reduction in diabetes um, through an HbA1c marker, reduction in weight, as well as um, significant management and control of, of blood pressure. This is at the individual level. Um, we also think that many of these are actually relevant at the population health level. And I'd like to briefly share um, the example of total health this is um, a set of villages um, in the Chittur area where um, Apollo has actually invested a holistic communi community development program and included health and non-communicable disease management as a very core part of that program itself. And uh, we've been able to follow people over a four to five year period, those who were diagnosed with diabetes, hypertension, and cancer. And we see that over this time period, we are able to proactively manage their conditions and control their blood sugars as well as their BP. I'm going to leave you finally with a message from our, the, our chairman, Dr. Pratap Reddy. Our life is priceless. I think COVID has taught us this tough life lesson um, and it is therefore imperative for every one of us to truly prioritize this above everything else, uh, above our professional pursuits, above our monetary pursuits and to truly uh, protect it with everything that we have. Thank you very much. Wonderful. 
వండర్ఫుల్ సత్య గారు సో శ్రీరామ్ సత్య శ్రీరామ్ గారు సో వీ హ్యావ్ సమ్ క్వశ్చన్స్ ఓపెన్ ఫర్ ఫైవ్ మినిట్స్ క్వశ్చన్స్ సో ఎనీబడి హ్యాస్ ఎనీ క్వశ్చన్స్ ఫర్ డాక్టర్ శ్రీరామ్ so so i'll i'll just ask uh, something so so it seems like uh, the population both in india and the us uh, indian community we have the same uh, genetic risk factors so so i think uh, whatever you mentioned that can be extrapolated here also in us absolutely and i think that is very much the intent a number of the work that is done typically tends to be around western and caucasian populations and given that our underlying genetic make- makeup and physiology is slightly different i think we owe it to the indian community globally as well as in india to uh, to take what we are learning here and and take it to the diaspora across the world i have a question what is the approximate cost of joining and for one or two years following the program per individual yes so um we have uh, programs that are starting from roughly about um um 6000 to 7000 rupees so that would be roughly 90 to 100 dollars perhaps um all the way to um program that is around um, uh, 20 or 25000 uh, rupees which is uh, 300 dollars so we we have that scale it comes down to sort of the set of um, diagnostic tests that you'd like to do for example on the higher end we do include ct and mris as well depending on whether you have that risk and on the lower end you know we have covered pretty much all of the blood tests and the imaging tests along with the physiotherapy as well as the mind health yeah hi may i ask a question uh, uh... that's a great a nice topic you talked about i am a psychiatrist so i know exactly what you're talking about affects our stress and uh, as well as adherence to treatment and diabetes and depression are going uh, in tandem and um, compliance and adherence is very poor if you have mental health issues as well same thing with cardiac uh, outcomes as well when depression is uh, coexisting with the dep- uh, car- cardiac problems the mortality is very high so i think in our fractured system of care we're not integrating the mental health as the physical health i think until we address that uh, elephant in the room, uh, living room we're not going to control the cause and improve our uh, just uh, my i couldn't agree more right and i think um, um that is our biggest challenge at least as we think about um when we think about preventive health we instantly think about immediately blood tests and perhaps if we are lucky a little bit imaging we never think about musculoskeletal we never think about mind health and our goal and objective here is to truly widen the definition right and if we think about our health holistically um then these are the aspects we must be thinking about and uh, you know you know better than me how mind health affects the physiology also and so we have to be taking into account uh, every aspect of this as we uh, as we go forward yeah i'll be covering a lot of the elements you spoke briefly about uh, about how to take care of ourselves at, in my topic at the end thank you oh, sounds good sounds good uh, thank you ravi and thank you dr sriram okay so we can move on to the next questions so as far as the moderation standpoint uh, dr uh, jagannath will answer questions but the rest of the speakers you know will have questions and answers at the end so next i move on moving on to the next speaker the, i just want to make a quote by benjamin franklin oh, uh, yeah there is some static there but anyway quote by benjamin franklin an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure early diagnosis the next next best thing to the prevention so this is exemplified most in the management of cancer so this is a cancer is a huge topic and dr jagannath is going to talk about cancer care and mm-hmm. our uh, renowned kidney specialist nephrologist kidney specialist and multi talented dr kishore belamkonda is going to introduce dr jagannath thank you thank you namaste and greetings to all this is a really a great honor and pleasure for me to introduce dr p jagannath who is currently chairman of the surgical oncology at the sl raheja hospital and the department of surgical oncology at the leelawati hospital and research center mumbai 
Dr. Jagannath is an internationally recognized pioneer cancer surgeon in gastroenterology oncology, gastrointestinal oncology. And Dr. Jagannath graduated with MBBS from Cornell Medical College with 10 gold medals. He then obtained Master of Surgery from Jipmer in Pondicherry. Following that, he joined Tata Memorial Hospital in 1982, where he had 20 years of experience as Professor of Surgical Oncology and Chief of Gastrointestinal Service. Then in 2002, he moved to his current position in Mumbai. Dr. Jagannath is an elected fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons of England, FRCS, and the Academy of Medical Sciences of AMS. He published more than 100 peer-reviewed research papers in journals, chapters, and books. Dr. Jagannath is an, is an, is an invited speaker or chairperson at numerous international conferences and has given orations in several uh, congresses. Apart from his exemplary professional and scholarly performance, Dr. Jagannath has been an outstanding leader in his field. In 1985, Dr. Jagannath started hepatobiliary pancreatic surgery as a specialty in India. And in 2002, he established Indian chapter of the International Hepatopancreatobiliary Association. Between 2012 and 2016, Dr. Jagannath served as the world president of the International Apatopancreato Billiard Association, the first Indian ever to receive such a distinction. Dr. Jagannath has a long list of contributions to the community in his field. Notable among them are establishment of a comprehensive website for cancer support, which was launched by Sri Amitabh Bachchan, a foundation called Crusade Against Cancer to Support Children with Cancer, with the help of Sri Sachin Tendulkar. Currently, he is leading the first cancer, that's the title, of a care project of the economic, World Economic Forum for using emerging technologies to improve cancer care. Last but not the least, despite his monumental and unparalleled professional achievements and service to the community, Dr. Jagannath is a very humble and simple person, just as I knew him during our college days in Kandal. That is a very rare a virtue he possesses. Thank you very much. Dr. Jagannath. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Kishore. Uh, I, I do feel embarrassed in this uh, introduction, but I tell you what I would really, uh, the one single line of introduction is uh, I am a student of Kanul Medical College, trained by some of the, the greatest professors, and then in Jipma and Tata Memorial, where I learned everything which I know uh, or I'm, I do not right now. So I think uh, these foundations were fundamental in all our growth. And I am sure it is the same across all the eminent panels here. It's really, Radhisisha Redigar, it's a really a pleasure that you, uh, and a privilege that you've given me this uh, chance to speak to the entire uh, NATA and uh, along with the APNA and the community who are so, uh, your leaders, in uh, in US and many other countries. So I would just focus on three different uh, themes. One is that how did we manage COVID uh, in the pandemic? How, how did we manage cancer in the pandemic? This is because you have a lot of uh, lay audience also. As doctors, we do know what was, uh, what was happening. And second thing is that how did we... I'm, I'm still having the... Uh, yeah. How did we uh, manage the uh, the care after the pandemic, and what is the future direction as to what we are going to have at this point of time? You know, the cancer mortality, COVID mortality, has been widely uh, put by you know by controversial numbers of uh, from the government of India and the WHO. Let's not get into that. But what really matters is that many succumb to diseases like renal, cardiac. And, and kind of course cancer as healthcare uh, facilities, as all of you know, were overburdened with COVID patients. Many of you have experienced uh, COVID from the other side. We as doctors have experienced COVID from the hospitals where nothing could stop and it only escalated and had different dimensions. All of us know that the, the three periods of pandemic were the first wave when, you know, somewhere in March, 2020, where suddenly I was actually in New York in February, came back and then straight away was swept away by the first wave. When we were just about relaxing, the Delta tsunami hit us 
that was actually the most traumatic uh, period. And finally, the Omicron did not spare anyone, including my 95-year-old father, who came out fairly, uh, I would say, without any problem, all thanks to vaccination. So if the single message for all, every one of you, there's nothing but vaccination as far as COVID is concerned. That's all. And nothing needs to be, uh, is to be scared about. And that is one thing which I like to have a mess, clear cut message for all of you. The healthcare professionals like me and many others had three different dimensions. We were caregivers on one, 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 uh, one point. And we also became patients in the same uh, period. And, but we were able to influence policy. This was a very important role where some of us could uh, uh, actually make sure that the policies are in, in tune with science and not with whims and fancies. This is a very important contribution by a lot of medical professionals in uh, India and across the world. Every doctor, nurse, and I must say that nurses and paramedical staff, they were on the real, real front line. As consultants, we had a little bit of a fortunate uh, thing so that we were at least not on 24-7 duty, but many of these people were on 24-7 duty. And many of the doctors became patients, particularly when the COVID information was inadequate. And at least they estimated that 800 doctors died in India and nearly 80,000 across the world. More than the deaths, many of my friends still suffer from long COVID. They are breathless, they are weak, and they are unable to uh, you know, be productive in the usual way. So this is something which we need to understand and carefully uh, look into that. We fortunately could manage the policy as well as the media. This therapy, when in, when in the beginning, was biggest problem was, as in the world over, the ICUs was just flooded, and then there was nothing we could do about it. And immediately, there was a, a SOS from the government that 80% of the hospital beds had to be for COVID. And then what do we do for cancer? All elective surgeries had to be stopped for cancer. That was the real uh, situation. And of course, there was a shortage of PPE kits, and the staff were continuously getting quarantined. At that time, the quarantine was almost four weeks. So they are off, off work for four weeks. And there was very, very acute shortage of all the, uh, all the staff. This is something which right now, it, it look, looks like a, a very bad dream, but this is reality. And the challenges for the cancer patients were multifold. Their surgeries got postponed. Someone who was scheduled for surgery in a week or 10 days time had to be told that we cannot operate on you. Radiation machines had to be closed because there was no way to keep sterilizing this equipment or even the staff had to be problem. Chemotherapy was a huge, huge blow. And access for travel. Unfortunately, in India, the number of cancer centers are few. People travel all the way, right from every corner of India to Mumbai, to Delhi, to Bangalore, to seek cancer care. And the lockdowns prevented from their travel. So this was something which was, which was very, very difficult to handle. Drugs suddenly disappeared, and then drugs could not be procured for chemotherapy. Imaging has stopped. CT scanners suddenly for all uh, COVID lungs, and they could not manage any of the regular investigations for the cancer patients. The patients had to wait agonizingly. And every single one of them knows one thing, that the lockdowns are not going to stop cancer. Cancer will continue, and that's a big reason for them to have multiple points of stress. And not only that, they had uh, unimaginable stress, stress for the whole family. I can just tell you a few true stories. Uh, my own good friend, my chartered accountant actually, <coughs> whom they had operated for a sarcoma in a way back in 1998, on regular follow-ups in 20 and 21, the series center, <coughs> no one was willing to come to the hospital. And by the time things got better, the CT showed a lung metastasis. And that lung metastasis, unfortunately, was involving the innominate artery, the very critical vessel in the heart. And then we had to fall back on chemotherapy, but there was some partial response. But again, in 2022, unfortunately, there's a progression of disease. A treatable cancer had advanced to a risk for life for someone who was had the access to care but could not produce or could not have the right diagnostic uh, follow-up in the right time. Surgeries for us was something which we can't even imagine now. We were in our PPE spacesuits, 
sweating away, having, you know, in four hours time exhausted. And this, this continued to happen for almost six months time because we decided at that time that we will not stop surgeries for cancer. All the obstructed colons, any, any patient who was symptomatic, we were there every single day in the hospital. Our resident staff were there for two years continuously and we operated. We operated all major hepatobiliary surgeries in this COVID times because there was no way we could stop surgeries and we could convince the administration that cancer has a priority and had to be taken care. But there were big problems as to how the patients had to reach the center. All, all the way from in Jharkhand, that CA stomach continued to lose blood and he had to be transfused multiple times for six months. Finally, we could, uh, he could come down and operate. And the same thing for police, police permissions for, uh, for travel all the way from Jaipur. And then I, I had to literally phone up the commissioners in each three states to make sure that the patient reaches Mumbai for surgery. These are the huge hardships. So effects of COVID-19 pandemic in, in short were patients are of course much more vulnerable. Delayed diagnosis was delayed. Screening programs completely stopped. Patients were much more reluctant, rightfully so, of coming to the hospitals. Treatment pathways had to be altered because no longer were a, a repeated cycles of chemotherapy possible. Many of the patients had to be deprioritized. Elective cancer work had to be postponed. And sometimes this was led to delays and suboptimal uh, uh, care. And clinical trials, which are so essential for long-term therapy development, were all suspended because there was no way to recruit patients for this. Chemotherapy really has suffered most. Every time they used to come to the hospital, they had to have an RTPCR, drugs were not available, daycares, which are the, the bedrock of chemotherapy, were all closed, and the staff were not available because they were all diverted for COVID duties, and every protocol had to be reworked. This is the data actually coming from India, from National Cancer Grid. Look at the numbers. The number of patients fell by 54%. Tata Hospital, which normally takes about 30,000 patients a year, this just could not even uh, have 54% across. This is across India. And the follow-up visits just did not happen. Admissions did not happen. Outpatient chemotherapy crashed completely. Surgeries were down. Diagnostic tests were not available. And of course, patient accessing radiotherapy really <coughs> came down. So in every dimension of uh, cancer, the care fell, down, fell by 50%. What is the impact? What has actually happened to these patients? Time alone will tell, but I know for certain that many of the patients who are otherwise amenable for treatment could not get their treatment in time because the cancer doesn't stop. The screenings may stop, the journeys may stop, the cancer doesn't stop. But let me tell you one thing, there has been a significant adaptation to this crisis. This is what I always feel in every threat is an opportunity. Suddenly we found that distributed cancer came, became essential. Every two uh, second tier uh, city, treat, patients were treated. My students are across all over the country in about 30 cities. Every one of them stepped up. And they all started operating in the same way as I would do it. And then I was so happy that same ripples, liver, everything was now being done, not in big cities, not in metros, but in tier two cities, way, way away from Mumbai, Nasik, Pune, and many other cities undertook the treatment of uh, uh, cancer patients, which was very, very important. The centralization and the waiting for treatment of three months to four months were completely altered. And this is very important. Telemedicine was rapidly adopted. Till, the, till then, the government was dragging their feet on telemedicine, but it is rapidly adopted on all the legal hurdles were removed. And many of the uh, uh, centers, including Apollo and many other players, uh, came into a telemedicine in a big way. And we converted all our consults into a tele-consultation uh, platform with a good data, good uh, uh, kind of a, a multi, multi-structured uh, platform. Outpatients were all screened. Our outpatients follow so literally and the comfort of the home, which patients really appreciated. Someone sitting in Assam coming all the way to Mumbai just for showing a few follow-up visits and follow-up uh, tests, not necessary anymore. And the doctors were comfortable because they were sitting at home and then doing their follow-ups. I was sitting 
in my my home in Hyderabad when we when we moved, and then we did the consults on a, every single uh, day, and both the doctors and patients were uh, happy that their follow ups could be taken care by a virtual consult. We did MDTs. We had a we had a we had a, a net group meeting where there was a pathologist, there was a radiation oncologist, and a surgeon and a chemotherapist all coming together exactly like an MDT which you would have in your hospital and do everything by a VC. And this this kind of uh, avoided unnecessary travel. Believe me, 30 to 40 percent of patients who come to Mumbai are only to be told that they are advanced and nothing can be done for them. Mm -hmm. All these patients can now be comfortably seen on an MDT and unnecessary travel, unnecessary expense for the whole family can be avoided by just using technology. And we could deliver standard care. It was not as though it is suboptimal care because all this uh, information was all possible by, by an MDT. So the hybrid approach has come to stay. We will never be going back completely to uh, physical follow-ups. Yes, we once we know that there's something to be taken care, they will certainly come. Otherwise, they can comfortably do a hybrid approach. So uh, now let me move to uh, the cancer care in the post-COVID. What had really uh, is going to be uh, for the future? And that's where I'll uh, leave you with some thoughts. Adaptation was very, very important. That's what we did. Second thing, what I realized very early access to care access to care was completely absent access to care was absent particularly for the most vulnerable population the rural population the urban poor could not come to the hospitals at all so access to care is the single most important focus for you and for us that today we have to have access to care for ncds not for covid anymore for ncds because that is the biggest bulk of morbidity and mortality in India and in the developing countries. So we can move the concerts, follow up, and even plan the treatments in, in a, using technology. Hybrid is come to stay. And we can also teach people because no, there is no longer necessity for us. We have now learned over the many, many, uh, maybe too many Zoom same, uh, same, uh, webinars, but we can teach people. We can also use newer technologies for learning and teaching. And the, the phase which I'm coming to is the use of emerging technology. A, a simple example is that we used to go to all these countries like Nepal, Bhutan, I'm sure. You also traveled doing your outreach programs, but that could not be done anymore. And But we started this virtual outreach program. which is highly successful. Cambodia, Vietnam, Bhutan, all these countries which were completely isolated. Nobody could reach them, but now connected on the virtual outreach of the IHPBA where we could, the worldwide experts could talk to them and also talk on the clinical problems, the problems, what they are facing and that we could solve from across the continents. So virtual consults across the continents are now very, very feasible and is being implemented by many of the societies. Now, uh, I, uh, Satya talked a little bit about the uh, HoloLens, which we are now using it for enhancing education ex experience because more than anything else, the, the AR and VR are going to transform. And I, in fact, I was reading today a, a post by Bill Gates that metaverse, though we, we, we think it's sometime in the future, is door, knocking at our doorstep. So, and we will see that we will find that the augmented reality and the uh, VR is going to make a difference. Look at this, that I can actually see a liver. I can move the liver in front of me and see the bile ducts and plan a treatment for this patient. And this planning can be done by three different centers, one in Japan, one in Singapore, one in India, by three consultants who are experts in epidemiology surgery. So studying the model and saying that, oh, this is what I would do. This is going to add a new dimension to teaching and uh, learning. I'll leave you with this last uh, uh, portion of the first cancer care. So what is first cancer care? Is a, is a World Economic Forum a project. On the World Cancer Day, we released the white paper, which is open source. Anybody can use it and what actually can be done to transform cancer care in India. The fourth industrial revolution, as has been coined by the World Economic Forum, is now use of technologies like AI, drones, blockchain, data, IoT, and robotics for making a difference. And when Honorable Prime Minister launched it, he says, solutions can be for India and for the world using the, the, four, uh, the fourth industrial revolution. What did we do so far? 
we formed a core group of uh, nearly 25 uh, technologists and clinicians and found first thing is and found very critical areas where there are gaps in cancer care. And then, then we did a technology survey and found 30 interventions. And this, this was across by all the majors, Microsoft, Dell, everybody, including the, uh, the startups. And the, the interventions are in three different formats. One is, of course, system, citizen and patient, and providers. So we have 30 interventions all mapped out right from screening to palliative care, the continuum of care, the data, payment pathways, everything has been mapped out very, very clearly, and interventions have been mapped out. Now, how do we then translate it? It's fine to be having a, a plan, but how do we implement? And this is the approach is that think big, sort very small, and scale fast. Now, what we have done so far is come up to the, the uh, starting, the small pilot uh, projects. And this is what I really want your uh, inputs on this. This is a proposal which has been accepted by the government of Telangana, and Meghalaya and Assam in three districts, Sirsila, East Kasi, which is the highest incidence of cancer, and Kamloop districts. One single district, the entire population. The major cancer types, which will be breast, cervical, oral, which all of you know, and oral uh, and esophageal cancer, which is very, very high in Meghalaya. So we want to scan the entire district population with a multi-pronged approach. And in all these things, only the uh, you know very high-end AI emerging technologies will be uh, utilized. And then we'll have a kind of a, a, a data in the community. For the first time, we are reaching the community. And Arishisha Redigaru, what you said is absolutely clear. We have to, the, other than prevention, which is tobacco association and all that, early diagnosis is the single most important tool for us for cancer control. I continue to see stage three and stage four. I want to see in the next decade, stage one and stage two, because we have solutions for stage one and stage two, and we can control for a long time, stage one and stage two. So this is the entire focus of stage shifting to one and two, by screening the population when they're symptomatic or even before they're symptomatic for a high risk population. And then we'll be able to uh, win the war. So right from tobacco cessation, cessation to technology-led screening, the healthcare worker uh, uh, learning phase and the entire shift is going to be from doctors to nurses to front healthcare workers. It's the skilling of the nurses and healthcare workers which is most important. So we are going to do that all by a good platforms which are going to be mobile friendly, very user friendly and where their learning becomes a very, very uh, easy and very important. So we need partners like you to have these pilots because one agency or one, uh, one organization cannot do it. And we really look forward to uh, uh, your help, support, and advice in how we can take it forward. And if we show that this happens in three districts, it is scalable across the states and even the whole country. So I always say that, you know, uh, Joe Biden is very fond of the moonshot, which rightly so. I know that this is a big challenge. We all know that cancer is a huge challenge. But if we all work together, we all work together, I'm sure millions of uh, lives uh, can be saved. And this will be even far bigger than putting the man on the moon because we'll be saving uh, millions. And uh, thank you very much for this opportunity once more. And uh, my sincere gratitude to each one of you. And look forward to your advice, opinion, and of course, uh, you know, participation in this whole exercise. And we can make a difference together. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Jagannath. Uh, so it was very wonderful and uh, humane and compassionate type of speech for uh, humanity, specifically cancer victims. So um, we have we are running a little bit short of time, but if somebody has a pressing question, let's go ahead and ask Dr. Jagannath before we move on to the next uh, subject. Yeah. Um, hello. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, this is uh, Sanjeev Aridi. I'm a gastroenterologist in New Orleans, USA. Dr. Jagannath, that was an excellent talk. We faced the same problems as you did uh, in the beginning of the COVID pandemic. We had a lot of things postponed. We couldn't do endoscopies, we couldn't do surgeries. The whole hospitals were filled with uh, COVID patients, but slowly we are getting back to the normal. 
And I totally agree with you, the bad events leading to the good, good things. Uh, the telehealth has become a pretty good, uh, even in this country, especially in India, when you don't have very many specialists like we have here, it's very important to have these telehealth consultations. People coming from Kadapa to Bombay is not going to happen when you are in Bombay to get your opinion on how to do the surgeries, what kind of surgeries they can have. So these things can be easily managed on the telehealth. You can actually <laughs> tell the people back in Andhra Pradesh yeah, or wherever I, I they are in India, try to do what point. to do and what yeah. not to do with regard to their problems. That will be a great asset for the uh, experts who can actually go on telehealth and give a consultation. So that's going to be a good thing, even in this country. Yeah, that that, that's, be... that's a good point, Sanjeev. Yeah, yeah very good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. Um, any, any, other, any other comments or? Yeah, telehealth in this, Dr. Mohan, uh, Dr. Jagannath. Yeah, telehealth has uh, picked up now, as you know, in US, uh, <clears throat> this uh, public health emergency is still going on. And uh, they said it is until July 15th because of the good reimbursement by Medicare and other healthcare insurances, the telehealth has picked up and uh, we had to wait and see what is going to happen after the public health emergency is uh, over, which is supposed to be on July 15th of this year. We'll see what happens. No, interesting that I, I, now patients want it. So there is no longer a question of we want it. Patients want to sit in their homes and then send the reports and get a consultation. So it will be driven by the consumer and it will also be a great health healthcare system because you'll avoid people coming in and all the entire process of uh, uh, registration and they get the same expertise and care. As long as we ensure the same quality of experts across, then we have, we have now we are going to create a pool of experts who will have, you know, like volunteer their time and they all can be uh, taken care. I, I am expecting at least 60 to 70 percent of patients to be satisfied with the opinion and seek a local care, which also we can recommend, yeah. which also we can recommend that you go here. These are the people who are trained, well trained and you, your job is done. That is a big uh, benefit, uh, uh, as you know, in, in India. So we can actually, instead of uh, centralizing them, having a distributed quality cancer care. Yeah, very, very inspiring, very true, very inspiring. And also the HIPAA guidelines also are relaxed <clears throat> in this country, uh, you know, the confidentiality guidelines. So appreciate it. We, we do what we can. We, you know, whatever you think we can do, we'll, we'll be happy to. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Jagannath. If you if, feel free to hang around or if you want to step aside, which is your call. Uh, so we appreciate your time. Your, uh, I, I, I'll, be, I'll be on for till 10 o'clock and then maybe then I'll finish. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so moving on to the next subject. So I want to introduction to be limited just to two, two minute introduction and uh, please the speakers stick with your time. Um, 15, 20 minutes talk. So the next topic is uh, sleep is one of the most important but least understood aspects of our life. We suffer from devastating consequences. Uh, okay, please turn the other phone off. Uh, okay, we suffer devastating con consequences when we don't sleep. Compared to the other basic drive... Okay, uh, compared to the other basic drives, such as eating, drinking, and reproducing, the purpose of sleep remains elusive. So there is a, there's a lot going on, a lot of uh, unknown in, in, the, in the sleep. So Dr. Prasad Garimala will clarify us about the sleep. He's also going to talk about sleep as well as long COVID symptoms. And Dr. Prasad Garimala is a highly accomplished pulmonologist that is a lung specialist in case the public don't know what pulmonologist is and has been one of the top on the top doctor list of Atlanta since 2019, Atlanta, USA. He graduated from my alma mater and Dr. Jagannath's alma mater, Karnul Medical College, and did his pulmonary fellowship at my old stomping ground, Cook County Hospital in Chicago. He has been practicing in Atlanta since 2004, and uh, he, is, uh, he is going to talk about, as I said, you know, long COVID and 
sleep. Sleep is the most important thing. Of course, long COVID also is very, very important. He's going to talk about it. So without any further delay, let me turn over to Dr. Prasad Garimala. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, and namaste to all. It is my pleasure, privilege, and honor to participate in NATA, API, and APNAS collaborative to a holistic, preventive, and proactive topic. Uh, it gives an immense pleasure for me to be participating in this. We're always reacting to the diseases to be able to prevent or send that preventive message gives me an immense pleasure. I appreciate and commend the interact, I mean, the, uh, all the work that is done by people to come up with this webinar. It is very commendable. Thank you again. I'm from Cardinal Medical College. Again, um, it is all the information that I got is, is coming through me and not from me. And uh, with the prostrations and gratitude to all the people, uh, including my professors at Cardinal Medical College and uh, all the people who trained me, um, I'll uh, spare, I mean, spare me another 15 minutes or so. I'll try to hit the main points because the audience are predominantly non-medical people. I'll try to go slow. And uh, the two topics I'm going to talk about are one is sleep and the second one is post-COVID. So off the bat, I'll give you the take home message. If you, it is very, very important. We all know that the sleep is very important and I'll tell you the take home message. Please read this book by Dr. By Dr. Matthew Walker. It's called Why We Sleep. It's a phenomenal book. And I think every, it should be in the elementary schools and the, I mean, not the elementary schools, but the high schools all across the world. So why we sleep? He wrote a beautiful book. Nobody could express that and 20, 20 or so uh, more elegantly than his, um, his book can. So sleep can make us happier, safer, smarter, and more productive. What else we need in life? So it's going to make us happier, safer, smarter, and more productive. So, and he gives all the information that is needed, the scientific evidence for that, and how we can change it. So in his words, I'm just using this next five quotes by him, Matthew Walker, non-negotiable biological necessity. And it's one of the drives that we all have. We can't live without it. To give an example, if people cannot sleep for five years, five days or so in a row, that can lead to death. So that's how vital and important it is. It is life support system. So it is supporting our life. So that dance, the 16 hours on, it is like a cosmic dance. So 16 hours on in our mind, and then eight hours off on an average for the adult is what is keeping us healthy, happy, safe, and productive. So that is why it is very, very essential that we all realize how biologically essential sleep is. It's a life support system. And then it is the most powerful elixir that the nature can provide to us by knowing over a period of millions of that evolution of the human uh, of uh, evolution. So the chemicals, the needed material are being produced at the right time for us at, uh, every day. So we are all born with our own pharmacy. What is needed for our mind, for our body, and it's the health of the mind and the body is being produced in our own mind and body. So the sleep by, produ by producing these hormones, the chemicals will auto adjust itself to the stresses that are brought to us. So in other words, like Dr. Matthew Walker mentioned, Swiss Army knife of health. So it has everything that you can you need so that you can fix your health if it, there is a problem. And it is definitely not an optional lifestyle luxury. Compared to 100 years ago, humanity currently is getting at least 75 to 90 minutes less sleep compared to just 100 years ago. So it is very, very important that we don't take it granted and we take a essential care of our sleep so it can take care of our health. So the four 
primary pillars, uh, the primary pillars, if you are sitting on a chair, say for example, it has four legs. So the sleep depends on these four legs. So sleep quantity, sleep quality, sleep regularity, and sleep hygiene. If we maintain those four of those legs, obviously we'll have a stable sleep and thereby stable health. So the first leg is basically the sleep quantity. We know this is for adults, at least seven hours of sleep is very essential for us. So in other words, if we prepare any kind of a dish, you know, we all cook, you know, um, if you prepare a curry, the right ingredients need to go at the right time. And then the duration that you are cooking it is also very, very important. If you don't cook for enough duration, obviously it's not a palatable or nutritious dish. Similarly, if you do too much, that's a problem. So it's a J-shaped curve and seven to eight hours of sleep is what you, we all need to uh, aim for. So when we are talking about sleep quantity, you know, it's reiterating, basically the ultimate outcome of this is the vitality for the body and meaning for our life. So there are multiple studies that have shown so better quality of sleep, better quantity of sleep will improve the attractiveness of the person, the weight loss, it, it is considered a weight loss medicine, having a good quality sleep and quantity sleep. Cognition will be better, vigilance will be improved, concentration, memory, learning, the emotional balance of the person, the fitness is much better, especially more, you know, it's uh, proven in a lot of athletes, if they have better sleep, the performance is going to be much better physically and obviously for men mentally too. So the energy maintenance of the body is where our fountain of, you know, fountain of life comes out. So the energy maintenance is well regulated when there is a good sleep. The immunity, the hormones, the restoration, the repair. Repair is the key part. We think it is a very passive state. No, actually there is a lot of repair to the body and to the mind that is happening while we are sleeping for those eight hours. So the flip side of it is, if we don't get our quantity of sleep, which is seven to eight hours of sleep, what is going to happen? It is linked to all these outcomes much more than this. You know what I'm listing here, the dementia is linked to it, the accidents are linked to it, poor productivity, school work performance gets um, affected, cancers, you know, WHO has come up with this, you know, night shift work or lack of sleep is one of the potential carcinogenic risk factors. So the obesity, like we said, if you have a good sleep, you are less likely to gain all that weight. If you don't get good sleep, you're going to gain weight and thereby leading on to the other problems like diabetes, hypertension, or heart attacks. So tired and hungry, or you can also call it as hungry, and angry. So either whatever word you take, if you don't have good sleep, you're going to be either hungry or hangry. So we all notice that, you know, when we are not sleeping well, next day, we are not going to be at our best. So that's about the sleep quantity. So let's move on to the next leg, which is the sleep quality. And there is a lot of research, you know, the research going on for the past 50 years or so, it's one of the youngest branches of medicine that, as we know, is sleep medicine. So what do we know about it is that, you know, we need continuous, uninterrupted sleep. If you sleep for eight hours, but you are constantly woken up by internal or external factors, that's not going to be good quality sleep. They are as tired as somebody who is drunk. So what, why is that so important? Because there is an internal cleansing that are detoxing that happens while we are sleeping. So in other words, if you have the street roads, they are going to be clean. Or another example I can give is a library. So if all the books in the library are not put back together, so it's going to be very hard and disorganized system for us to get a retrieve a book when it is needed. Similarly, this drainage is basically like while we are sleeping, the neuronal cells, the neurons are going to shrink and the glial cells are going to open up and basically create a drainage system. So the toxins that are generated by our activity during daytime are going to be cleansed out of the, out of the mind, out of the brain so that you are more sharper 
next day. So what do we, other things that we know about sleep is basically there are five stages. So recent classification, the stage three and four combined together are called delta sleep. So technically we have four stages of sleep. Sleep one being the non-REM sleep or uh, stage one is basically the lightest of the sleeps. Then stage two, then three and four together are called delta. And then we have this special rapid eye movement sleep where most of the dreaming occurs. So this is all regulated by our internal clock system that is both genetically highly, highly regulated and evolutionarily preserved from the time of the fruit flies. See, fruit flies are very, very tiny. You know, that's how the sleep research is done on the fruit flies. So they take the, the same gene similar genetic mechanisms that are happening in a fruit fly are still happening in our mind, in a, I'm sorry, in our brain. So the other thing that we know are process C, which is a circadian rhythm, and then process H, which is homeostatic. So the rhythm is maintained by the process C, the drive is maintained by the process H or homeostatic mechanism. To give an example, circadian rhythm is maintained by the sun and our activity level. The primary thing is the sun. The sunlight exposure will suppress our sleep chemicals and improve our wake chemicals. When the sun goes away, then the melatonin gets produced and our sleep chemicals are going to build up and our wake promoting chemicals are going down. So that's a nice cosmic dance or a rhythm that you can see that maintains our 16 hours on, eight hours off. Then what we call these regulators, how all this is happening is mainly by these cues or regulators that are happening, whether they are external or internal. So in a German word was used to describe this, this are called Zeitgebers. So again, going back to the preparing the dish. So there are six centers in the brain that actually produce the sleep promoting chemicals that are produced at the right time and right doses for us to be able to maintain a good quality sleep while we are refreshing, regenerating and repairing our body and mind. So the internal regulators are these chemicals. So um, some of them are wake promoting, some of them are sleep promoting. The external ones, 95% of the time it is the sunlight, the activity and food also play into the role of our regulation also. So what is the outcome of all this is these good hormones that are being produced at the right time. These hormones are going to maintain every aspect of our health and our life and our ability to be a human being. So the growth hormone is so vital and important. And as we age, we get less of it. If we maintain a good quality sleep, at least we will get what we are supposed to get for our age group. So this ends the second leg, which is the sleep quality. The third thing I want to focus is the sleep regularity. Sleep regularity means you want to go to the bed at the same time and wake up at the same time. The wake up time is called the cue time. That's how body kind of readjusts for the next day. The cue time, in other words, what time you gotten out of the sleep is what it is trying to fix. So for any rhythm, you need to have a fixed thing upon which the rhythm builds up. So the cue time, the time that we wake up is the, such an essential thing. And we also, you want to avoid the social jet lag. What does social jet lag mean? We sleep, maybe get about only four to five hours during the workday, but over the weekend, you sleep longer. That is not actually a healthy habit. So you want to sleep at the same time and wake up at the same time, even whether you're working or not. So that is very, very essential. We, you know, um, Indians across the world, especially the people, non-resident Indians, we are notorious for our late night parties and that social obligation. I strongly recommend whatever you do, do it maybe like around three o'clock so that everybody leaves your home by 10 o'clock. I know it is not a fashionable statement from my side, but I'm telling you, if you have 50 people you are inviting, everybody's sleep is affected that night. You're actually giving him some trouble so that you know that night, even though there's a lot of pleasure from a meeting, but there is also something that if we are going till one o'clock at night, that is not good. 
So I think collectively we should start the parties early so that everybody sleep at a reasonable time. Why are we doing it? Mainly we all have the internal clock and there is an external clock which is in the form of sun. So the sync or the coordination between these two is what gives the sleep regularity. So the sleep regularity will lead on to us, a body and mind to produce, uh, the brain to produce these hormones of metabolism, which are produced at a particular time. If they are not produced at the particular time, you are losing that chance. So the hormone imbalance will automatically lead on to the problems. It builds up like a iceberg phenomenon. While it is happening, we may not be noticing it, but once it, a threshold effect occurs, that's when all the disease manifestation occurs. And one last point on the sleep regularity is sneezing is not good. It is not good for the body or the brain. And basically, do not snooze. Get up at the right time that you intended to get up and then maintain that time so that body has ability to auto adjust. That completes the third leg. Just a sleep regularity. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, we have 10 more minutes. Uh, that's what Shruti. the timekeeper has informed me. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you again. So the fourth leg is basically the sleep hygiene. What do we mean that? While we are sleeping, you don't want any interruptions to occur. And we want to encourage a good quality sleep. So it has to be dark and cold and avoid any kind of external stimulation. So the darkness is going to be key. So I strongly recommend people to buy a eye mask while they are sleeping. So that preventing that light, whatever it is coming from, a simple light that is coming from a TV monitor, the blue light or any other place, you know, we have a lot of this light that escapes. That is also going to interrupt with the sleep. So that's why darkness is very important. If you can do it externally, like blackout curtains, that's good. In spite of it, that our electronics will emit some of the light. So do an eye mask if you can. It's very easy, easy to get adapted. Cold, roughly about 65 degrees of Fahrenheit is a, a good temperature. Our body temperature goes down by half a centigrade whenever we are trying to sleep. So that's why uh, I think keeping it cold will encourage better sleep and avoid the stimulants, caffeine, alcohol, tobacco, marijuana, in whatever form that is coming, Whatever form these uh, stimulants are coming, we need to, or the suppressants are coming, we need to stop them or control or eliminate or even um, limit as much as we can. The sun time, like we said, a sign being the side gaber, primary side gaber or a controller of our sleep wake cycle, it's very important that we don't get too much exposure to any light after 6 p.m. Uh, or 7 p.m. after the sunset. And uh, you know, um, that's why it's very important. To overcome this, sometimes we use the light boxes or phototherapy to adjust the rhythms of uh, the sleep wake cycle. Screen time is a key. So I kind of uh, putting this, you know, uh, F dot L U X. If you download that app on any computer or on your phone, it will automatically decrease the light, especially the blue light that the screens are emitting so that your melatonin is not suppressed so that you have a better sleep. So encourage people to download or use some other kind of a blocker of blue light. Then worry time, um, stress versus, you know, uh, stress that comes through the day activity needs to be put down. So either writing down the problems and the other thing that strongly recommend is like, we only live in our present. We never live in the past or future. So these four Ps, being positive with life, being present, being purposeful with our activities and driven by the principles. If we do those four, that worry time automatically comes down. We have the shock absorber to take care of that stress that the world throws at us. And then nutrients, magnesium, potassium are very important. Low glucose is related to low motivation. And that ends these four pillars or four legs of a sleep on which the health is built on. So one last slide I have on sleep is basically these are the sleep disorders as sleep specialists and many of the physicians will be taking care of it. If you have any of these disorders, please reach out to your primary care doctor or the specialist and we will be able to, they will be able to take you to a better quality and quantity of sleep. 
So I'll move on quickly with the, uh, to the post-COVID syndrome. In the po what is post-COVID syndrome? As we know, uh, this COVID-19, um, you know, it is affecting, it goes through the stages. The first phase is the viral phase, then the inflammatory phase. And most of the people have improvement in their symptoms by four week period. But, you know, um, but some people, even though they had, even if they had mild disease, they continue to have the symptoms that they experience for after that initial recovery. So if the symptoms persist more than four weeks after the diagnosis, that is called the post-COVID syndrome. And uh, so there are many names for that because most of the COVID information came, came into the world through non-medical media. So we got most of the information through not journals, but sometimes these TV channels and social media. So there are a lot of names that are colloquially used, long haulers, long COVID syndrome, and there's a medical term. So there's still a lot of uh, clarity that is needed for post COVID syndrome. Next slide. Um, whenever we had COVID as uh, intensivist working, somebody who's working in the ICU, we have seen these severe damage that occurred in about five to two to five percent of the people um, who got the COVID. Depending on the uh, variant, we had more. Some had more. Some had less. And uh, you know, we have seen patients who are like being prone, twenty-year-old, twenty-two-year-old, who we lost some of them. We got, you know, we saved some of them. Uh, but many of these people had not only lung involvement primarily, they also had other major organs in the body that are involved, heart, the kidneys, the brain. And, uh, in, you know, they took a longer time to recover from that organ damage. So that organ damage can also prolong and that organ damage led to some of the COVID symptoms. So in some people, you know, it led to these, uh, you know, life-changing uh, very in, unfortunate events of heart failures, kidney failures, the strokes, and then some Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is basically a temporary paralysis. So who gets a post-COVID? Most of the time, somebody who doesn't have this um, robust immunity, that's usually older people and people who have medical conditions, more likely to have these symptoms. But even the young, otherwise healthy people have the post-COVID syndrome also. And what are the common symptoms? Fatigue is by far the worst and most common of the post-COVID syndromes. I have seen friends, family, and my patients who have fatigue. And I'm not sure how we treat it. There is not a generalized uh, um, treatment protocol or management protocol or even diagnostic protocols available, unfortunately. But that's one of the most common symptoms. And then we have seen as pulmonologists, the post-COVID cough, post-COVID shortness of breath, some rheumatological conditions like joint pains, the chest pain, the muscle pains, the memory concentration, what they call the COVID brain or the fogging that can happen. Um, then obviously the palpitations, which is related to the heart and um, the heart beating faster or slower and depression, anxiety, our good friend, Dr. Kali is going to, uh, Ravi Garu is going to talk about uh, that in, in uh, next, uh, next topic. And then fevers, persistent fevers, dizziness when they stand, we call it as orthostasis. And then uh, one of the other things is any physical or mental activity, they are okay when they are resting with any activity they are having trouble. So the diagnosis, unfortunately, there is no single test for us to confirm the diagnosis. It is by exclusion. And depending on the symptoms and the exam, your physician may recommend lab tests, imaging, and referral to a specialist. So there are some blood tests that can be done, a six minute walk test, a breathing test, or a CAT scan is what we normally do in the pulmonary or a lung field. Cardiologists will do a stress test or an echocardiogram to evaluate for these things. And then obviously if your symptoms are there more than four weeks or so post-diagnosis, I strongly recommend that you reach out to your physician, see if there are any reversible conditions that can be reversed um, to decrease or alleviate the symptoms. And like I said earlier, there is no specific treatment for post-COVID syndrome. It also depends on what kind of symptoms they have and which specialist and what studies have kind of guided uh, the patient and then the doctor to get the best remedy um, or alleviation of the symptoms. 
And so far, the available data is very limited by the sample size. It's very, very hard to do a reliable research. And most of the time, the reliable research takes a few years. By the time, hopefully, the pandemic and all these symptoms are gone, we wish that for the rest of the world that we learned from the COVID and we kind of that helped us to be better human beings by taking care of our health first, then our families, and obviously give the best to the world around us. I th that's my last slide, and I will take the questions at the end of all the presentations. Th thank you very much, Prasad. Excellent talk, very timely. Both topics are very timely. I think I have a lot of questions on the sleep, but uh, I think we need to move on in the interest of time. So, so I'll go to the next. Uh, diabetes is potentially affects all of us and has a, at least, potential to affect all of us and has a huge impact on various body systems and functions. And Dr. Padmaja Adusumali will be introduced by Dr. Apna President, Dr. Praveen Sampath. Uh, Praveen, are you, are you logged in? Yes, Dr. Reddy, my video is not working. It's just disabled. Uh, okay, okay, go ahead. Anyway, we, we know uh, who you are. We saw you initially, at least. In Hello, everyone. Uh, go ahead. I'm uh, Praveen Sampath. I'm a gastroenterologist in uh, Austin, Texas. I'm also the president of Apna Foundation. Thanks, Dr. Reddy. Gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Padmaja Adusumali. She's a very good friend of us, very active in the APNA Foundation, uh, who has a great uh, interest in community health and community health education. Dr. Adusumali is a uh, resident of uh, Kansas City, where she did her internal medicine residency and uh, practices at the VA Medical Center as an internal medicine physician and geriatrics. She's originally a graduate of uh, Gunter Medical College very, very active uh, in the community health and uh, diabetes is one of our passions. And uh, as Dr. Reddy rightfully said, growing incidence of diabetes among the Indian population and uh, without making, taking too much time, I give the stage to Dr. Adesumali. Go ahead, Anil. Padmajigar, go ahead. I think oh, it's a video. Uh, she it's uh, an MP4 forwarded. file I sent. Yeah. Uh, I think the audio is not coming through, though. We can hear you, Andy, and see you. So, Padmaja, can you go ahead and initiate the conversation while they are working on the video sure. and all that? Okay. Uh, do you want me to go ahead and start talking about it? Yeah, please do. Yeah, so to enter in the time, conserve the time. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Adhisheshwar Adhikaru, uh, for letting me know that it's better to go ahead and start with the conversation. Meanwhile, um, while we are getting the details, uh, the my topic is why do we all need to know about diabetes? Uh, my opinion, diabetes is a silent killer. It is affecting so many people knowingly or unknowingly. We have a diagnosed patients, a lot of patients, and we have a lot of undiagnosed citizens, both in India as well as in America. Uh, especially both of our Telugu states are getting a lot more affected. And I would like to uh, bring this to uh, attention of every one of us uh, to notice uh, the earlier symptoms of pre-diabetes that uh, like Dr. Satya Sridhar mentioned earlier, that's where my topic is going to be. Um, can I have the slides, please? Okay. Uh, Ram Reddy, uh, I guess they must be working on it. Uh, for the, uh, so okay. Please bear uh, with them. Uh, okay. Uh, Once I get the slides, I can give you the numbers. Uh, thank you. Uh, I will unmute mute myself, and then there is a video recording there. Or if it is, then I can go ahead and continue the talk. Diabetes, as I mentioned, is a silent killer. Diabetes and obesity caused more deaths. Uh, 
more deaths during COVID as well as after the COVID. Uh, they are here. Can you go to the slide before? Okay. Sorry, Andy. Uh, since it's a MP, MP4, we cannot go back to the slides, Andy. So sure. go ahead and continue the speech, Andy, generally. Yeah, do the best okay. you can. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, I think in India, um, that, that's where I'm very, very uh, concerned that our, we as Indians, we have a highest incidence of diabetes diagnosed and highest incidence of undiagnosed diabetes. I really want uh, to pay attention that I want to bring this attention to air, uh, bring this uh, concern to all of our citizenry in India, as well as our uh, Indian origin Americans too. Uh, uh, the numbers, uh, I am not uh, able to remember the exact incidence of diabetes in India, but 77 million Indians or do have diabetes at this time, and there are so many undiagnosed. Uh, diabetes, uh, there are a lot of risk factors, especially our diet, anyone over the age of 45 or um, anyone that is um, had a family history, uh, either by a parent or a sibling or a daughter that had diabetes, or if they had a history of polycystic ovary disease in women, as well as gestational diabetes, or if they had given a birth to more than nine pounds baby, and uh, they are at increased risk. Currently, a lot of Indians, as well as our Indians that are working in the IT fields, even in the US, they are doing uh, these telehealth jobs or tele jobs where it's uh, less physically active, sitting in front of the computers, being in the, um, office rooms, um, attending the calls and all. So the, you might have heard in your communities that a lot more people are having sudden cardiac death. And we most of the time may not know exactly how, but the, these sudden cardiac deaths are undiagnosed cardiac disease as a complication of diabetes. Um, the numbers right now, um, some of the slides I, I had shown how um, it causes cardiac disease. Um, Pre-diabetes is what I wanted to pay attention to. Pre-diabetes, as it means, it's a precursor to the diabetes. That means it's a one step or one stage before diabetes. This uh, main feature of pre-diabetes and why it is caused is by insulin resistance, meaning the, our body is giving a lot of resistance to insulin. Even though insulin is our own body creation, the inflammatory um, uh, mediators that are coming from fat cells or adipose tissue is making our insulin not working. So pancreas gets overworked. It trying to produce more insulin. These higher insulin levels causes a lot of heterogeneity, meaning they cause the cholesterol plagues. And even though a patient may have uh, cholesterol not that high, but if they had higher insulin levels, it causes the plagues. So that's why how they develop the uh, cardiac disease and they develop the sudden cardiac, um, uh, uh, cardiac arrest and uh, they are dying. I heard multiple patients dying in the last few um, um, days. There are two types of diabetes, type one and type two. I'm not going to uh, go into the details of type one, which is a genetically, and it's more common in uh, children. Uh, in adults, type 2 diabetes is a lifestyle disease, which it is caused by lifestyles. It is changed by lifestyles. So I'm going to focus more on the type type, type 2 diabetes. Uh, the pre-diabetes, as I mentioned, is a precursor. Uh, in the US, the actual diagnosed diabetics are only 35 million. But 89 million American citizens do have pre-diabetes but only 8 million people know that they have prediabetes. 78 million people do not know that they have diabetes. That means one in nine people know that they have prediabetes. If we don't catch them, they, they go ahead and develop the diabetes and the complicated complications due to the diabetes. The ne next, um, I, I want to talk about how do we diagnose? Do we have to go to a, a doctor to get diagnosed as pre-diabetes? Or are there ways that we can even look at the person and say, oh, uh, could I be having a pre-diabetes? Should I get checked? 
And what do I uh, get chucked is my next question. When you see some patients who are, or some people that are really overweight and having a lot of abdominal obesity, and they, you know, most of the time we hear the jokes about either men having a pregnant belly or uh, some patients having a little bit of a, a, a obesity around their abdomen. Those patients are at higher risk to develop this diabetes type 2 or pre-diabetes. And the, uh, some patients do develop sudden acute onset of discoloration around their neck folds, under the arms, in their groin area. That is, that is reflects insulin resistance, that dark discoloration. Even a normal person looking at it, oh, he did, he, he did not have it before. She did not have it before. Why is she having the dark color discoloration? Or the second one is skin tags. They are like a telugulo chapalante pulupura laga ostayayi. Adikuda pre-diabetes on the patient's lo common ostayayi. And some of the people do develop discoloration in the face area, sudden onset. Um, then those patients, then they, they need to talk to their doctors. These pre-diabetic patients, do have symptoms also. They feel very tired, they feel hungry, so they end up eat, consuming a lot of calories and consequently have a severe weight gain. And with the weight gain, they do feel very tired, very, they feel down because they're gaining weight. They also feel depressed. And earlier, uh, I think Dr. Garmal Lagaru and Dr. Uh, Sriram did mention diabetes and depression is related, and Dr. Kohli is going to talk more about it. In, in teens, they do develop a acne in the pre-diabetes state. Um, they uh, get irregular periods and later on develop polycystic ovary disease, and they do have problems with the infertility. These things, a doctor doesn't need to tell you. If you have any of these symptoms, to go ahead and talk to your doctor, and the doctor or physician can check some blood test. A normal fasting blood level is less than 100. When we check these patients, pre-diabetic patients, when we check their uh, blood sugar level, it uh, ranges between 100 to 125 milligrams. If it is above 126, we diagnose them as diabetic. On, if it is above 126, on two separate uh, occasions. As well as there is another test called hemoglobin A1C. That also is get checked. It tells us the blood sugars over the last 90 days. If it is above 6.5, we can diagnose them as the diabetes. Um, if it is less than uh, you know, 6.5, but above six, that is the indication for pre-diabetes. There is a, the third factor, the, these patients do tend to have a higher blood pressure and a higher cholesterol levels. These high cholesterol, especially in the bad cholesterol and triglycerides, the good cholesterol HD is, uh, HDL is low. That particular configuration is a indicator for prediabetes. The next one I want to talk about is complications. Um, I do not want to talk about the treatment because your physician will do, but the, if we don't get treated or diagnosed or treated, what complications would arise is what I want to focus on. It, you know, all the way from the top to the bottom, starting from your eyes to your feet, you will develop a problem. We develop the problem in the eyes. They develop earlier cataracts and they also develop a bleeding in the eyes called diabetic retinopathy and causing blindness. And they, the patients uh, do develop cardiac, sorry, cardiac problems with the heart attack, heart failure and strokes. They do develop uh, problems with the um, uh, kidney disease, going up to the end stage the renal disease, needing dialysis. The next one, they do get uh, problems with the non-healing ulcers in the, in the uh, legs and develop amputations. The pregnancy complications, as I mentioned earlier, and then they do develop some sexual problems in men with the erectile dysfunction or impotence and uh, amputations, as I mentioned. Diabetes or pre-diabetes, these, you know, caused by uh, pre-diabetes, are leading causes of blindness, leading causes of end-stage renal disease needing the dialysis, leading cause for the amputations. And it also causes two to four times of the heart disease. And the one important take-home point I want you to all take home is type two diabetes is preventable. Preventable, changeable by your own lifestyles. That, is, that control is in your hands. That's main, especially with the diet and exercise. 
And I, um, uh, my next speaker, Dr. Uh, Swarnamandali, is a graduate of Kansas. She is going to talk more details about the diet and nutrition. Thank you, Thank Padmaja. You. Thank you, Padma. Great talk, and it was a timely and essential talk. Um, appreciated. But uh, I understand that Padma Swarnagaru is not able to join because of bad weather. So we'll move on to the next subject, and uh, the questions for you will uh, address at the end of the uh, everybody speaks. So thank you. So next we'll go to the next speaker. So uh, you all know how important the heart is to all of us. Dr. Enos, Enos will speak about the heart disease uh, among Indians. Uh, so this is a huge topic and it's, a, it's going to take quite a bit of time, but because of the time limitations, we need to stick with 15 to 20 minute time to Dr. Enos. That's what my humble request. And then uh, as to introduce Dr. Enos, uh, one of our distinguished cardiologists and uh, APNA Foundation uh, board member, Dr. Bhavanand Reddy will introduce Dr. Enos Enos. Bhavanand. Thank you, Dr. Adishesha Reddy Garu. Uh, as a cardiologist, the next topic that Dr. Enos Enos is going to present is very close to my heart and mind. Uh, basically, like we are all know, uh, pretty much like a sudden death of like a two prominent athletic Indians, I will call athletic for a reason. Uh, Puneet Rajkumar, 46-year-old uh, actor from Karnataka, and Gautam Reddy, 50-year-old IT minister from Andhra Pradesh. Uh, there are specific reasons behind that. I think uh, to present this topic, I don't think there is any better physician or a better person than Dr. Enos Enos, who has dedicated more than 30 years of his life and work, particularly on this topic. Uh, just to give some little introduction about Dr. Enos, He's a graduate of uh, uh, University of Kerala, migrated to United States in 1970. He's the chief executive officer of CADI, that is coronary artery disease in Indians, a research foundation solely dedicated to the diagnosis, uh, treatment and prevention of coronary artery disease in young persons. Dr. Enos is the principal investigator of a landmark study, which is called CADI study. Uh, this is coronary artery disease in Indians, which was published in 1996. This study demonstrated that American Indians, especially Americans of Indian origin, have coronary artery disease three to four times more uh, prevalent than general population. He was actually uh, selected as the top physician of America in 2003. Uh, for the past 19 years, uh, Consumer Research Council of America has recognized him as one of the top cardiologists of this country. Uh, he has organized international working group on cardiovascular disease among Southeast Asians. Uh, by drawing experts from uh, United States, UK, uh, Canada, India, and then this was conducted three years in a row. He is the chair of first two annual Indo-US health summits of heart disease held in like New, New Delhi. He authored more than 100 articles published in uh, America, British, and Indian journals. He presented more than 1,000 uh, lectures, especially like a guest lectures and uh, grand rounds. He wrote several book chapters and books. Dr. Enos has received several awards, most particularly a Distinguished Physician Award from American Association of Physicians of Indian Origin, American Association of uh, Cardiologists of Indian Origin. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Enos Enos to present his next talk. Thank you. Thank you so much for that generous introduction and inviting me. Can I share the screen? Okay. Uh, or inviting me to speak on the why do Indians die from malignant heart disease at a young age? Unraveling the enigma and mitigating the risk. Okay. This topic actually started with me some 50 years ago. And last 30 years, I have intensified my efforts. In 1990, I addressed the, the heightened risk of heart disease in young Indians for the first time. In 1995, I linked it 
to lipoprotein little day. In 2018, the National NHLBI reported that one in four Indians have an abnormal cholesterol called lipoprotein A. And in 2018, the American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association jointly uh, stated South Asian ethnicity and lipoprotein related lay as heart disease risk enhancing factors. My slide is not, okay. This started from 1970 to 90. I came across six young Indian physicians in the 20s and in the 30s and in the 40s. One of them died. Uh, who got the first MI at the age 25, died 11 years later, waiting for the transplant. And at that time, my observation was limited to Chicago. Then soon I realized that Professor Littler in the UK noted four Indians having massive heart attack between the ages of 18 and 22, and he could not find a single white individual in the UK. This was followed by Balarajan reporting that death rate from heart disease among Indians aged 20 to 29 years is three times higher than the whites. This is the angiogram from my friends at the age of 37 who had a heart attack out of the blue and he had a large coronary arteries. There is a pervasive myth that Indians have small coronary arteries, nothing could be further from the truth. This is the same angiogram of the same individual 10 years later. Anyone would say that a person has extremely small coronary arteries, but this was rapid malignant progression of the heart disease. By age 47, he had ejection fraction 25% and he was practically inoperable and he was identified to have very high li levels of lipoprotein little day. And that led to my coining the term malignant heart disease in young Indians. Nobody bothered, and many of the distinguished Indian professors said, heart disease is heart disease, nothing different about Indians. I made the observations, there are four of them, extreme prematurity, severe diffuse, and left main disease and angiogram look like those with diabetic people and rapid progression as I just showed you. Equally high risk among vegetarians and non-vegetarians, strangely high rates or higher rates among women despite low rates of smoking. This is worse in India than in the US and we already covered the, okay, this is the plaque removed from the co right coronary artery of a vegetarian professor with the picture perfect lifestyle and duration of the stay in the United States only seven days. This day, the knowledge on the subject changed from heart disease among Indian diaspora to Indians in India. This is the angiogram showing left main disease, LAD 99%, and you saw the right coronary artery uh, completely filling. He had emergency quadruple bypass surgery and lived another six, uh, 10 years. Now, when I was talking about the malignant heart disease in young Indians, we did not have any data from India or Indian data for that matter. This is from the Institute of Health Metrics. And every one of you who are listening should pay attention to these slides and the slides that follow. This is death rate under the, between the ages of 15 and 49. These are ages when we don't expect heart disease, let alone die from heart disease. India, right? High and going up. China, low and going down. And now, number of deaths under the age of 50, India 185,000, China 88,000, USA 15. 
So the number of deaths among Indians under the age of 50 from heart disease is 12 times higher than the U.S. This is even more startling. 29% of all deaths under the age of 50 is among Indian men. When it comes to Indian women, one third of all deaths under the age of 50 in the world is Indians. For women, the standard is 4% compared to 31% for Indians. Okay, I did the CADI study on Indian doctors, the cardiologists, the teachers, the preachers who know what to do. And the Indians, this orange color, they had four times more heart disease than white Americans. No difference between vegetarians and non-vegetarians. The rates are similar to New Delhi and Chennai with the Kerala and Goa having higher rates. So we look at the risk factors. There are many risk factors, modifiable risk factors, standard, cholesterol, blood pressure, tobacco use, diabetes. And then you have risk enhancing factors, high triglyceride, metabolic syndrome. And then of course, there are genetic and non-modifiable factors. One thing I will be coming to and focusing more, lipoprotein little a is a modifiable risk factor and that is on the verge of becoming a modifiable risk factor. And we did this study and found that the smoking and obesity were one-tenth that of Americans. Other risk factors were similar or lower with the exception of diabetes, which was 9% then and now 18%. So the $65,000 question is, why do Indians get heart, high, such a high rate of heart disease? This is from the New York Times article on February 2012. In the UK, it's a big topic because the National Health Service is going broke, taking care of Indians with heart disease at a young age. There, there is what is called the US Biobank study. Half a million people, Indians and South Asians, heart attack and other coronary events were doubled. But this is the most important slide or important fact. When the risk is predicted by pooled cohort equation used in the US or Q risk three used risk three used in UK, the risk were identical, which means the risk prediction tools we use to predict the risk and treat does not predict the risk among Indians or underestimated by 50%, 100%. Now, this study further confirmed levels of lipoprotein letting a genetic risk factor is 19 nanomoles. Indians have 60% higher levels of LPA letting This lipoprotein is 99% genetic and it is double that of Chinese. Now, many of you may not have heard or even the cardiologists may not be familiar with this, and they have only limited time. So read these articles. Lipoprotein literally an unrecognized genetic risk factor for malignant heart disease in young Indians. This one, lipoprotein literally in all populations and heart attack. And this is lipoprotein literally how it differ from other populations. This is an important slide. This is the famous inter-heart study. And in that, lipids explained 47% of the heart disease, smoking 88%, diabetes 12%. Lipoprotein literally explained 10% of the heart attack. Almost identical to, to, identical to uh, diabetes. But in this study, only 9% of the people had high LP literally but other studies have shown 
that lipoprotein little a affects 71 million people, 321 million people, compared to 71 million having diabetes. Even if you take 77 million, still diabetes is, or LP little a is four times more diabetes, uh, dangerous and four times more common and as dangerous as lipo, as diabetes. So diabetes is important, lipoprotein little a is more important. Now, is it all lipoprotein little a? How about the established risk factors? Like tobacco, high cholesterol, about one, 20 to 30% of heart disease, particularly almost all heart disease under the age 50 is highly correlated with LP little a. At other ages, Established risk factors, smoking, cholesterol, blood pressure, triglyceride, metabolic syndrome. Then we have unhealthy body weight and waistline, unhealthy diet loaded with a saturated fat and trans fat. In India, air pollution has overtaken smoking. Then two dreaded things. These are poor awareness, treatment and control of risk factors especially in India, and even worse, low quality of cardiovascular care before, during, and after a heart attack. So the American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association jointly recommended South Asian, LP, South Asian ethnicity and LP little a as ASCVD risk enhancing factors those with this risk enhancing factors qualify for statin therapy if their LDL is more than 70. So this is no longer Dr. Innes crying in the wilderness for the last 30 years. This is American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association saying that, yes, we have a major league problem. And what are the other risk enhancing factors? One is triglyceride. It's coming up, and also, of course, LP little a. This is an important slide. Coronary artery calcium burden and incident cardiovascular death. If you have calcium score, it's a $100 test. You do it if your calcium score is more than 1,000. Your chance of dropping dead is increased fivefold. Nothing else, no other question, or no other risk factors needed. Number two, there is another test. One is calcium score. If you're 1,000, you are danger. This study explains, this slide explains most of the heart attack and death among Indians. If your calcium score more than 100, and LP literally more than 50, your chance of having a heart attack or death in, is increased fivefold. In my view, lipoprotein should be, can be and should be measured as young as age five and lipoprotein little and calcium score as young as 30, both men and women. So these two numbers, which are not, both are risk mar markers, Now, having explained, we know why. Genetics loads the gun, environment to pull the trigger, and our treatment is, uh, in, in particular India, is extremely suboptimal. The current management of LP little a is statin therapy, unless the LDL is already below 70, or bring it below 70, and you need most Indians who do not want to have a heart attack and do not want to be one of the statistics I showed you under the age 50 should consider taking medications. How about HDL? I told you about LP, literally you have to start worrying. I have good news for you. Stop worrying about HDL, IHDL, and low SDL. 
of similarly high risk is no longer considered a risk factor of importance or risk factor of treatment, and you can stop worrying about it because 90 and 90 percent Indians have low SDL. Now, heart disease over the last 50 years, this is from 1969 to 2019, has become one of the most predictable, the preventable, and treatable of all chronic diseases. This is the UK data. Heart attack death rate has come down by 85%. Finland brought it down by 84%. US by 70%. And most countries have brought it down by 25 to 50%. So what do we do? We heard uh, proactive measures from Apollo hospitals and everything. But there is a life symbol seven is what the American Heart Association recommend. You implement, this looks very, very simple, but it's not as simple as you think. And what are they? Stop smoking, no question. Eat better, no question. Lose weight, control cholesterol, get active, control sugar, and manage blood pressure. Now let me get into a little bit of nitty gritty of these seven things. The United States, the American Heart Association has come up with what is called ideal cardiovascular health for Americans. And this applies to Indians, but Indians need specific modifications, which I have made. And this is that modifications. If you do these seven things, it's recommended that these seven things among Americans reduce the risk of a heart attack, stroke, and cancer by 80 to 90 percent. We don't have the data. I predict that if we do these seven things for Indians, we can also reduce the risk by 70 to 90 percent. What are they? Not smoking, that includes BD2. Indians need double the exercise. 20 to 30 minutes, we have more abdominal obesity and insulin resistant. Healthy diet, no change. Our body mass index should be lower at 23, BMI 23. And ideally, Indians, waist circumference for men, 39, 90 centimeters for men or 35 inches, and women, 80 centimeters or 31. If we look the, at this as the gut point, 80 to 90 percent Indians have these values, but it's not paid attention to. Then you don't need the doctor to, to get these things. You can do it. But there are next three things you need the help of a doctor if these four things should help get the, the numbers down. Ideal blood pressure. 120 over 80, no longer 140. The ideal blood sugar, you already heard the lecture before, 100. Then there are two numbers you have to remember. The ideal cholesterol, not 200, it should be less than 140. And you don't even have to measure the LDL. And if you're measuring the LDL, it should be less than 70. Okay, the evidence diet works. Banning the trans fat, cutting the saturated fat, lower the LDL from 120 to 100 to 105. Among Americans who consume an average of 14 ounces of meat a day, whereas Indians consume half an ounce of a meat a day. There is now evidence that the benefit of lowering the LDL from 90, many people consider acceptable to 30 with PCS canine inhibitor injection. And I'm not recommending that, but to show you that by lowering the LDL to that level, reduce the risk of a heart attack, 
by 25% in three years. And if you extend the, the treatment, or if you maintain LDL low, 40 milligram lower LDL from birth due to genetic favorable mutations, if you lower LDL by, if you have 40 milligram lower LDL, the risk is reduced by 54%. Again, we have written a paper for statin use. I think this should be followed by all Indians, wherever they are, because there are so many guidelines. Indian cardiologists see 300 patients a day and they have no time to apply the formulas. So we have made it simple, order of priority. Uh, sorry for my voice. I'm just recovering from COVID. Uh, or six days after the diagnosis, so my sound is a little raspy. Uh, highly recommended for people with heart disease. But new recommendation, if you have blood pressure, diabetes, or tobacco use, you need statin therapy regardless of the age. Forget about the formula. The editorial explains that. And if you check the cholesterol, cholesterol 170, you don't need anything else to start. The second order of priority. Then if your lipoprotein little a, remember one in four Indians have high LP little a, and 100% of Indians have the ethnicity, South Asian ethnicity, and or triglyceride, it is reasonable to use statin therapy. And based on, you know, yes. Yeah, we have a running short of time, so we can. Yeah, just, just finishing it. Okay, yeah. now. The statins, you can lower LDL by 50 to 60% with the high intensity and 35 to 49% with moderate intensity statin therapy. Weight, a five year, a five feet, five feet woman, recommended weight is 118 and six feet man is 169. Blood pressure, I already told you. So coming back to, we should pay attention that Indian women account for 31% of all death in the world under the age of 50 and Indian men, 29%. Indians should be treated differently and early. So what have we learned today? The, there is no mystery about the heightened risk of heart disease, including extremely high death rate under the age of 50. Indians have a genetic predisposition mediated by LPA little a, and LPA little a is found in 25 to 44 percent of the population compared with the seven to eight percent for the diabetes. This LPA little a start blocking the artery from age five onwards and explain heart attack after age 18. And risk is furthermore synergistically increased by all our usual risk factors. And life symbol seven for Indians should be implemented, not after a heart attack or four bypass, from starting from primary school onwards. That's the time you start. You start treatment after the age 50 or 60 after the bypass. It's like putting the fertilizer on the week before the harvest. Life symbol seven for Indians should be implemented as early as possible. And most Indians, they hate medications, but they would require starting therapy to maintain it below 70. And about 600 slides and 200 pages of information is available. Some of them are old, some of them I already showed you. And I'll be happy to address all your questions. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you, Dr. Enos. Thank you very much. It was timely, very, very important topic. And it doesn't jolt the Indian community. I don't know what else will. <laughs> so moving on, we have a 
the next speaker. Uh, thank you. We'll, we'll, if you hang around, we'll have some questions at the end. So uh, next week, po power of positive human connections enhances happiness and happiness en enhances longevity. And Daniel Amos in his recent book, You Happier, he said that 30% of that happiness and all that is uh, genetic, but 70% is modifiable. So you should do everything to modify and to make it clear to us, to, to help us understand and practice. Our uh, next speaker is Dr. Ravi Kohli. He is president-elect of uh, API, and he will be introduced by his predecessor and current president of API. American Association of Physicians of Indian Origin, RP is American Association of Physicians of Indian Origin. Dr. Anupama Gotimokkala will introduce Dr. Ravi Kohli. Anupama, please. Thank you, Dr. Adi Sisha Redigaru, and thank you, Nata, for organizing this wonderful session. We are all focused on prevention, so that's what RP is working this year as well, uh, focus more on prevention than disease cure. So without wasting much time, I just want to give a brief uh, about uh, RP upcoming convention, which is happening in San Antonio, Texas, and it's from June 23rd to 26th. And uh, I'm so proud that uh, Dr. Prem Redigaru, founding member of NATA, is our gold sponsor. Uh, thank you so much, Prem Redigaru. We miss you today. And uh, there are a lot of activities, but the main theme of this convention is on heal the healers. So we are the healers of the because of the COVID. So we focused more on wellness packages and uh, reflexology, yoga sessions, and uh, lifestyle medicine talks, CME talks, and uh, physician burnout talks. We have leaders leadership coming from all the way from AMA president to Texas uh, leadership. So without wasting much time, let me introduce our speaker, who is uh, Dr. Ravi Kohli. He's our incoming uh, president-elect. He will be taking the gavel in less than five weeks. Uh, so Ravi is a board-certified uh, psychiatrist with additional qualifications in addiction, forensic, and geriatric psychiatry. He's a psychiatric medical director at SP. HHS, Director of Outpatient Mental Health and Drug and Alcohol Treatment Program in Western Pennsylvania. He's uh, very uh, extremely seasoned in leadership. So he has been in the ATMG USA as past president and uh, Ram Khanna Rangaraya Medical College and uh, Tri-State Association of Physicians of Indian Origin, TAPI, Pittsburgh. And um, welcome, Ravi. And uh, we are looking forward for your talk. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Anpama. Talk uh, of the hour now. Okay, thank you, Anupama, for that introduction. And also, thank you, Al Sheshradiana and uh, Nata, Api, and Apna for giving me this opportunity. I don't want to waste too much time. Uh, let me get to the topic. And I'm going to talk about uh, human connections and uh, positive emotions. Uh, as you all know, mental health is defined not as the absence of illness, but also well being reflected by dealing with life stressors, working productively, and also contributing to the community. That's important. What is the incidence of mental health problems? About 50% are diagnosed at life one time in their life and about 20% at any given year. And also one in five children have mental health problems and one in four have severe mental health problems. Uh, George Valant, a famous psychiatrist from Harvard defined uh, uh, different dimensions of mental health, abnorm above normal health, uh, mental status, positive psychology, individual maturity, emotional, social intelligence, subject to well-being and also resilience. I'll kind of cover all those aspects a little bit here and there. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, mental health challenges in Indian diaspora. We have a stigma in our communities about facing mental health issues, and we kind of avoid seeking treatment. And there are many factors for that. And as a matter of fact, South Asian immigrants have a higher risk of mental health problems because of many issues, including communication, acculturation, immigration, discrimination, as well as microaggression they face every day. 2018 study showed that stress-related acculturation and all these factors affect the mental health of uh, immigrants, especially the South Asian. So getting help is not easy for us, especially uh, as opposed to the white middle-class people who can seek help very easily. And um, why is that? Parents expect uh, highly you know, of their children, given their own success and their own sacrifices, they believe uh, children should succeed beyond uh, uh, their own success they have achieved. 
So that puts extra pressure on the children. In fact, the prevalence of psychological distress among children of immigrants is double the first generation immigrant population. And children of Asian Americans, Pacific Islander, Latinx have even more uh, anxiety and depression compared to European immigrants. Then there are cultural uh, issues like privacy, proud self-reliance, preference for non-Western medicine, une uneasiness with American healthcare system also deter us from taking care of ourselves. So we need to break all these barriers. And uh, immigrant children also face financial, logistical, cultural language cha challenges too. So, but also we have to ask some questions among ourselves. Is it also because we misunderstand health, mental health as an important part of our well-being? Because families use mental illness as a weakness or a strain on their family <coughs> reputation and dignity? Is it because if we seek help outside, does it mean that uh, there is some, uh, some shame involved? Is it because that uh, we uh, support uh, our children beyond their uh, early adult life into their late life, giving advice, giving financial support? So we kind of avoid ask, uh, seeking help outside sometimes. Is that all these factors play a role in us for avoiding treatment and uh, seeking help outside? And also we might feel inadequate if our children seek help outside of the family. <coughs> so these factors may be playing a role in uh, uh, kind of uh, putting a barrier for seeking help. And also Indian perspective, Dr. Chaturvedi, the enhanced director mentioned that uh, it's easy for people to talk about physical symptoms and illness than to express their emotions or feeling depressed. These are the, some of the vernacular vocabulary. Sometimes they may not capture the clinical aspect of the mental health. Sometimes lack of right vocabulary also prevents us from seeking help in a mental health setting. So we kind of somatize and complain about you know, physical illness like fatigue or sleeplessness or stomach aches or headaches rather than seeking mental health treatment. So the call for action is that we all have, as a communities, as individuals, as media, as professionals, policymakers, institutions, have to rise to the challenge in addressing the stigma and barriers for mental health. And now coming to post-COVID and COVID, stress is everywhere, especially during this COVID pandemic, stress is overwhelming our capacity to function and cope. So uh, stress can trigger sympathetic nervous system activation of a fight and flight reaction. So what are the outcomes of stress and the trauma? Let me go back. So, so stress can cause a uh, some restoration of balance after some time or succumbing to the stress or post-traumatic growth, post-trauma growth. Sometimes we can become stronger and better after a stressful event. And these are characterized by greater observation of life, closer relationship with our family and friends and the community, identification of new possibilities that we didn't realize we have, and also realizing our own internal strengths and positive spiritual changes. These five dimensions are seen in people with post-trauma growth. How can we achieve that? Let's look at it. And origins of fear, why we fear, why we fear the unknown, why fear? But fear has a survival prote protection mechanism. Fear makes us be aware of the threats in an, our environment and protect ourselves. But uh, this fear is uh, good for an, our ancestors who lived in the caves with the precarious life situations, frightening and threatening life experiences. But this same fear is not necessary for us to be so hypervigilant, constantly being threatened by kind of imaginary threats and more real threats. But our, our genetics are predetermined because our ancestors survived because of the threat to signal they have, and we inherited that by natural selection. So we all have same mechanism, but that mechanism is not needed as much as we, our ancestors did. But uh, we, this, what was a feature was a, it became a bug for us now. So we need to avoid reacting constantly, uh, fearfully to every imaginary threat rather than real threat. So what are the fallacies that we do in our thinking about why fear is perpetuated? Generalization, we kind of attribute uh, one feature of, a, uh, of an individual specimen to the entire uh, group of, uh, that uh, represents that. So generalization is a fallacy that we fall into to perpetuate fear. Another fear mechanism is perpetuated by kind of a confirmation bias. We like to be hear what we already know and what we believe rather than face inconvenient truths. So that kind of takes less cause into demand on us to kind of new, learn new things and challenge our own biases. So we succumb to fear that, suc and that reinforce our own fears and biases. And finally, another important mechanism is confirmation, I mean, cause and effect by uh, conflating. So when two things occur, they don't necessarily mean cause and effect. They could be correlation, for example, 
hot sun can cause snow uh, ice cream to melt ice hot sun can cause sunburn but these are correlated but they're not causation ice, ice cream melting and having sunburn whereas hot sun has a causation effect these two don't have the same causation effect they're a correlation as a as the uh, slide illustrates a joke here that kind of illustrate the point a guy was uh, tearing a pieces of paper and throwing it out of the window of a city bus and when he was asked why he was doing that he said to keep the elephants out of the city street and uh, then the next guy said there are no elephants in the city he said see that what i'm doing is working that's why there are no elephant but so he's conflating the cause and effect versus correlation there so we do that even as medical scientists and researchers sometimes we conflate cause and effect versus correlation and coming to social isolation the deadliness of social isolation has been recognized 2019 it declared the worldwide concern about 50% people are living alone as a matter of fact uk just uh, appointed a ministry of loneliness in 2019 and japan followed recently in 2011 so why because 43% are living lonely they have a 45% increase of mortality it's equal to smoking 15 packs of 15 cigarette pack a day uh, the risk factor include as as severe as obesity and smoking as severe as cholesterol and all those things so what is the neuroendocrine uh, phenomenon behind it social isolation has been recognized as a major risk factor for morbidity and mortality in humans for more than a quarter century population based longitudinal studies have shown that social isolation is a risk factor independent of other health behaviors so human and animal investigation also <coughs> the endocrine stress mechanism that may be involved suggests chronic isolation is activates hypothalamic pituitary adrenocortical axis what about why well, let me illustrate it from babies to elderly we are all socially psychosocially embedded and when that is uh, severed sever that ties are severed we have a, a kind of a high illness burden and we don't recover well from our health challenges quantitative analysis showed uh, studies showed among 400000 married couple when a spouse dies there's an increased rate of mortality by 18% in men and 16% in women loneliness affects immune system research found that freshman students who reported feeling lonely have a reduced immune system response when they were given flu vaccine they catch cold easily and they don't recover well people who are more socially integrated have better biomarkers for physiological functioning such as low blood pressure body mass index lower cholesterol c reactive proteins etc so loneliness is affecting your immune system affecting your heart or diabetes and all these factors why is it so because remember we as a, a um the uh, social species where human beings are social species we are born prematurely uh, because we have the bipedal stem uh, as we evolved instead of a four leg animal we came for a two leg animal so the baby has to be delivered earlier than its maturation so a lot of maturation takes place outside of the womb up to two years they are maturing so these two years are very important for protection and their survival so it requires more than a mother and a father to say take care of the child a community is needed to protect the child the infant child for it to survive so such social bond so important for our survival and that is embedded in our genetics and what about social contagion data from framingham study showed that becoming happy depressed or obese are strongly mirrored by similar changes in your close friends so it's kind of amazing to, to imagine that if your friend is happy you're happy if they're obese we can be obese too an investigator found a geographical contagion as well if your friend lives within a mile you have 25% more likely to be happy if a neighbor is happy you have 34% more person more likely to be happy this is illustrated by this slide which i'll skip so harvard grant study i'll skip it a little bit george veland again said uh, who was the uh, uh, team leader for the study which is a 50 year study when the study began nobody cared about empathy attachment but as we studied the more and longer the relationships are important for our survival and well-being and aging in his book he talked about the stable marriage is so important relationships are so important for her physical as well as emotional health as important as alcohol tobacco cessation and all that robert waldinger who followed his uh, same study as the third director also did the same statement taking care of your body is important but tending to your relationship is even more important of a form of self care that's a revelation for him he is a zen master but he realized the importance of relationships friendship loneliness skills is powerful as smoking and alcoholism so 
we need to avoid loneliness. We need to improve our communications in our relationships. So be intentional in spending time together with spouse or your partner, because we hardly spend enough time with family. 20 minutes, we talk to each other in a week. We need to spend at least 20 to 30 minutes catching up with each other. And use more I statements than you statements so they don't become defensive. You express your feelings rather than attributing anything to them. I'm kind of skipping fast to catch up as much. And uh, tips for improving quality in communication, express negative feelings constructively. If you're constantly giving criticism, nobody's going to listen to you. So don't uh, always show resentment, disappointment, and disapproval. Because you have to give at least four or five compliments before you do one criticism for the other person to accept your feedback openly. So be specific, don't be kind of vague and generalized again. Be specific about what you're uh, disappointed or upset about. And don't uh, do a mind reading. Actually, I do the mind reading opposite. I expect my wife to know what exactly is on my mind all the time and take care of that. So, uh, but we should avoid mind reading as well. So listen without being defensive in your relationship and express your positive feeling. Like I said, appreciation, affection, respect, admiration, approval, and warmth should be expressed generously to our spouses because they do so much for us. And uh, then they're more likely to hear a negative comment or negative feedback and more likely to correct uh, the thing that they need to correct. So emotional intelligence is another factor that we all need to develop. That is the ability to recognize our own emotions and manage our emotions as well as emotions in other people, how they're reacting, how they're thinking, and how to read them and how to negotiate a mutually beneficial interaction. So again, Dr. David Goldman wrote a book on emotional intelligence. Many people talked about it before him, but he kind of popularized it in his bestseller. Accurate conscious perception of your own emotions. You name it to tame it. You have to name your emotions for you to be able to tame it. And then modifying your emotions. And again, recognizing the emotions in other people and negotiating the relationship with them to kind of reach the common goals. Why is it important? People with high emotional intelligence accept themselves and others better compared to people with low emotional intelligence. They communicate assertively as opposed to passively and aggressively. They display empathy versus lacking empathy. And is it important for you to succeed in life? Yes, more than IQ and technical skills, which we all have pretty much an equal share. Some of us have more uh, emotional intelligence, they tend to succeed better. 85% of your success as a leader is determined by emotional intelligence. And in any job, 66% of your success is determined by your emotional intelligence. Sometimes you look at the C-suite uh, executive, they're more emotionally intelligent if they're to be succeeding uh, as a leader of a team. Gratitude, practicing gratitude is so important. And studies have shown that people who practice gratitude have better uh, cognitive health as well as uh, physical health as well. And uh, why is it so? Uh, it's a uh, gratitude uh, increases life satisfaction, happiness, optimism, as well as empathy, empathy and fewer symptoms of anxiety and depression. In a cognitive framework, you have a positive attention bias, positive interpretation bias, positive memory bias, leading to positive neural changes and psychological and physiological changes, leading to sense of well being. In a psychosocial uh, framework, the same thing, uh, when you receive an act of generosity, you have a increased pro-social behavior, you do the similar act of kindness or generosity to somebody else and increase the social capital and social bond and sense of connection and well-being. So again, religion, religion has a different meaning for different people. Religion, the word religion has a different etymology. One of the etymology is binding together. And uh, if you, it's interesting, religion has the same etymology as well as yoga. Yoga is union, yoga, coming together. And uh, so these are all similar in concepts, coming together either with each other or with God is what religion is. Religion is a set of practices, beliefs, worships, and sometimes it can be good, sometimes it can be bad. But beyond religion, spirituality is very important because it develops gratitude, altruism, well-being, and forgiveness. And roots of generosity, again, it's so important. Like many of you are very generous people contributing to the community. Dr. Prem Radhigaru is a prime example and a role model for all of us to be generous. And uh, he's such a great example for that. And uh, generous, we are generous species. That's a kind of a uh, startling statement because we're all believed to, made to believe that we are a selfish uh, creature, selfish animals, and aggression is for, uh, important for our survival. But as a matter of fact, there's a nuanced experience and explanation why generosity is so important 
for our species survival. And it runs deep in us. And uh, according to this uh, theory, biology of evolution, um, we, like, like I said, remember how social bonding is so important. Generosity is also so important for social bonding. Species as diverse as bees, birds, vampire bats, rats, chimpanzees, exhibit a forms of generosity called pro-social behavior and that acts to benefit them as well as others. So our survival depended on each other being generous to each other in, in our ancestral time. The occurrence of generosity across species suggests generosity may be an evolutionarily adopted behavior. So uh, what are the benefits of generosity? Most of, most of studies have uncovered evidence humans are biologically wired for generosity. Acting generously activates same reward pathway that activated by sex and food. Correlation may explain why giving may help feel good. So doing well, by doing good, we do well. That's what the ben, I think Thomas Jefferson said. And uh, so we can do well by doing good. And uh, further evidence also suggests deep roots of human generosity comes from many studies. As well as especially in children, they're so sharing and caring and generous. That kind of goes away as they grow and becomes more uh, kind of uh, competitive with each other. And uh, again, a many more minutes, have, uh, yeah, maybe yeah. sorry to interrupt. Yeah, yeah. No, I'll, I'll skip quickly. Basically, I'm kind of stressing on generosity because so many of you are so generous. I want to applaud you and kind of validate your yeah, giving as the important part of your well being as well. And uh, well, small acts of kindness it doesn't have to be millions of dollars, just helping each other, holding the door for each other can be important as an act of generosity. Optimism versus pessimism is again an important part of emotional wellness. What is optimism? Optimism is characterized by people who think problems are not permanent. People uh, think who problems are not pervasive. It's not personal failure. Problems are changeable, circumscribed, circumstantial thinking. So you don't uh, own the failure. You kind of attribute the failure to many things and try to correct that mistake or a failure. And you're more likely to succeed in the future. So again, physical activity is so important for our physical and mental health as well. We talked about it earlier. And uh, by psychologically, it gives us a sense of self-efficacy, distraction, and immunologically, it improves your immune system. And physiologically, it does a lot of good things as well. And another important thing is spending time in the nature is so important. And uh, there are some books and studies have shown, it's called Shinrinkin Yoku or forest therapy done in uh, Japan. It showed that spending time in the nature, for example, even in your, in your own yard, doesn't have to be like a hiking or a forest or trip or anything. You can just go outside and spend time in the nature that helps with your mental health. And uh, there's actually some physiological mechanisms behind it as well. I, I won't go into that too much. And wisdom and knowledge, the final slide or final point I want to make is, we live in a society driven by data, information, and knowledge, which is good. But beyond that, we need to develop wisdom. Data is just a, like a fossil fuel, while information is like a, a crude oil and the knowledge is a petroleum product. But finally, what we do with that knowledge is important, not just knowing what to do, how to do it, but why we're doing it. And when we move from a knowledge-based society, from a consumer-based society to wisdom-based society and contribution-based society, we're much more likely to be survive as a society. Western society thought human uh, knowledge will uh, survive, uh, solve all the problems, but they did not. Actually, they made it worse. So it's important that uh, we not succumb to the media, exposure constantly giving sound bites, but think more deeply and more uh, kind of widely about the various experiences we go through and de develop wisdom. Our ancestors lived with wisdom. They lived in forests, they lived in the nature, they did the meditation, they did the positive, uh, like mindfulness, all those things. That's how they kind of became so wise and so many scriptures were written by them that we're still reading and benefiting from that. I think we'll go back to that uh, old wisdom-based society. Again, a simple tip. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Rick. I'll skip yeah. here and I'll, I'm done. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity again. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ravi. Excellent, uh, timely topic. And uh, we should practice, even if you practice 25% of what you said, We'll be better people and we'll live happier. Yeah, yeah thank I, you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, you know, we are running behind, but uh, but then Swarna Garu, you know, she had a, a tornado warning and then uh, her power failure and all that. So now she's going to join.
by phone and give her I see. a nutrition. She, uh, she is going to talk uh, on uh, nutritional management. She's a PhD in uh, nutrition and uh, works at University of Kansas. Kansas, in Kansas City. Yeah. yeah, so Swarna Garu, just to so agree, thank you for agreeing to make it brief. So five minute uh, presentation, you can go ahead, please. Nutrition and health. Uh, you are on mute today, Swarna Garu. Swarnagar, you're a mutant. Swarnagar, uh, unmute. Please unmute yourself. Not sure if there is any uh, yeah. weather issues there again. Okay. So let's continue, Andy. Uh, yeah, let's continue. Okay. So, so let's, uh, you know. Probably she, has, probably she has internet problem due to tornado warning. Yeah, oh, possibly. Yeah. That's yeah. what, it is, Andy. That's what yeah. It is. Okay. Okay, then. Uh, so let's go ahead and uh, I don't know. I got a text. The Swarnagar joined, but I don't know whether that's accurate or not. But uh, no, yeah, yeah, we can see her on the. We but, can uh, see her here, but uh, some yeah. audio and video issues are there because of the weather. Yeah. Okay, okay, let's go ahead and move forward. I think we have a limited time. We are ran behind. So, can we limit one question for each speaker? You know, can we limit to one question for each speaker? So, so anybody want to go? Like, like I, I'll go ahead and start off in the interest of time. So okay, I'm going to go to cardiologist, Dr. Enos and Dr. Bhavanan. Uh, you know, the aspirin, you know, it's all evolving, you know, aspirin. Uh, is that for cardio prevention? What's your, uh, what's your take on cardio prevention you know, using aspirin? And what is the latest um, in 2022 for aspirin, use of aspirin? Aspirin was recommended some 40 years ago before we had effective control, medication to control blood pressure, cholesterol, or diabetes. Since then, studies after studies after studies showed that the risk of bleeding outweighs the benefits. And the latest guidelines from the United States Preventive Services has all but limited the use of aspirin in people without heart attack to those 40 to 59 years of age with sufficiently high risk of a heart attack and sufficiently low risk of bleeding, which means aspirin is in the bottom of the armamentarium and should be avoided. And the new aspirin is called statin is the new aspirin. Okay, thank you. What about Bhavanand? What's your comment on that? Yeah, so I, th I think Dr. Enos, uh, you well said. I just want to add a little bit because uh, all these studies that were done so far are in the Europe and the USA. I think the representation of Southeast Asians in these studies are pretty much low. If you take an average, like a 40 year old uh, Indian, until proven otherwise, they have dyslipidemia. And then if they have an additional risk factor like a diabetes, hypertension, or a smoking history, or a family history of coronary artery disease, I think their 10-year risk for having a heart attack is more than 10%. I think as for the guidelines, what they have said is, it is beneficial for the people, those who have 10-year risk of heart attack is more than 10% to use aspirin unless they have severe risk of bleeding which I believe most of the Indians, those who are more than 40 years of the age, has any of the problems like either coronary, uh, sorry, like a family step, premature coronary artery disease, or hypertension, diabetes, or smoking history, should start taking low-dose aspirin. I think this is a gist of summary. I went through all these guidelines like ACC, AHA, European Society of like Cardiology, and then US Preventive Services Task Force guidelines. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. This is uh, this, Dr. Russell, this is a question for Dr. Enos. Dr. Enos, the, the continuation of the aspirin, the calcium score, uh, the you know the real absolute indications and the 
use of aspirin uh, basing on the calcium score. And second thing is, uh, second question is about apoprotein A. Do you screen uh, routinely along with uh, LDL cholesterol? Uh, it's a good question. Thank you for asking the question. Uh, practically all the guideline makers have made recommendations of testing lipoprotein little a in one way or other. Mm -hmm. But the one I agree the, the most, that is the 2021 Canadian guidelines. And they said that practically all guideline makers agree lipoprotein should be measured once in a lifetime and you don't have to repeat it. Yes. Number two, when to do that, Canadian guidelines recommended and made it simple. You measure the lipoprotein little a along with the first time you measure the lipid profile. And that help you identify. And there are two risks, short-term risk and long-term risk. Nothing predicts a long-term risk of a heart attack than lipoprotein little a, which start plugging the arteries by age five, whereas smoking consequences blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes, all those things, except for the genetic, starts at 30. So I think you should measure it preferably the first time you do it and should not repeat the LPA little a. Provided it's yeah. done the right method, it should be measure, measured by a method not affected by LPA isoforms and reported in nanomoles per liter. And you identify your uh, the high lifetime risk, uh, that's one. Now, you also mentioned about the calcium score. And the I think we can no, do it no. offline. The, the, yeah, calcium, the yeah. calcium score, women had no problem for getting mammogram done when turned 40 or 45 or 50 recommendation change. Calcium score tells you what has already happened to you, happened to you with respect to your coronary arteries, the calcium score is high. And of course, there is a, up to 100 was normal before. Now 100 means threefold risk. And if you're high LPA, little a, you are in the highest risk category of 20%. So we have to get out of the aspirin mode and start using statin, which is Thank you. 100 Thank you. times safer. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Uh, so. I think, uh, you know, before we complete the questions, a brief uh, word of thanks. Dr. Sanjeev Reddy is going to say a brief word of thanks, and then we will have time for a few more questions. Sanjeev, uh, please brief. Yeah, please. on behalf of NADA and APNA Foundation, thank you all for arranging this excellent seminar. Dr. Ajay Reddy and the team, Ram Reddy, Subhar Reddy, and uh, Narayan Reddy. It was an excellent job. We had an great speakers who actually spoke very well. I would like to thank Dr. Sangeeta Reddy, Dr. Sriram, Dr. Jagannath, Dr. Prasad, Dr. Padmaja, Dr. Swarna, Dr. Enes, Dr. Ravi. All did an excellent job doing this um, webinar. Really appreciate on behalf of NADA. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. So do any questions for, uh, thank you Sanjeev. Thank you, Nath. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions for uh, other speakers? Let's say Dr. Prasad Garimala. One question for each speaker. I have a question for uh, Dr. Ravi Kuli. I, I know that like emotional intelligence is absolutely important for success. Is there any ways and means to improve that? Yeah, definitely. Uh, uh, like uh, as I said, I said, a lot of these are learned uh, abilities. If, some people are naturally born with that, but not necessarily it is. You cannot not learn it. Like as I said, I said, seventy percent of these optimism, emotional intelligence are learnable skills. And one thing is first to learn, be aware of the importance of emotional intelligence, because there are so many people are so cold sometimes they don't understand other people's emotion. They they don't listen. Active listening is so important. Empathy is so important. These are all skills that we pay attention to and we internalize those uh, patience, empathy, compassion, self-care, and uh, self-compassion as well. You don't have to be perfect. 
Uh, you can just keep on practicing until you get better. Acceptance, mindfulness, they all go together with uh, emotional intelligence. Thank you, Bhavani. Okay. Any other questions? Maybe the sleep. I have one question if nobody has any on sleep. Uh, so this, uh, you know, this, I read this book by Matthew Walker. So he says that uh, even older, you know, the sleep amount is the same. But our, our understanding is that when you get older, you need less sleep. But according to Matthew Walker, he says that sleep is the same whether no matter how old you are. Is that correct, uh, Prasad? Yes, sir. Um, um, I think it is uh, true. It, in general, as we age, you know, 10 year old will need 10, year, 10 hours of sleep. But it is a myth that, you know, as we age, we need further less than seven hours of sleep. Uh, there is one exception is that about 3% of the population, they are short sleepers. They need only four to five hours of sleep. And that is basically because of the mutation that occurs in the brain uh, mutation and they need only four to five hours of sleep and they can still be productive, happy, healthy. And uh, so uh, it may not apply to everybody, but the rest of the 97% unfortunate people need that seven hours of sleep. Is Donald Trump one of them? <laughs> I'm not sure whether it's the genetics or the drugs. I see. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, anyway, he sleeps, uh, he says that he sleeps only four hours or something. Right, right. Yeah. And uh, and then any other, any other questions for any other speakers? If nobody has any questions, I have one for uh, Padmaja. Uh, anybody else has questions? I also, my battery is also, my laptop is getting, coming to an end here. Uh, okay, Padmaja, brief, uh, quick question is, uh, in his recent book, Lifespan, um, David Sinclair, he's the author. Uh, his, uh, his, the, the title of the book is Why We Age and Why We Don't Have To. He recommends that everybody take metformin and he actually takes one gram of metformin himself. He's not a diabetic, he doesn't have elevated uh, hemoglobin A1C, but he still takes it because it has prolongs the life expectancy and he thinks it is beneficial to human race, to, uh, to all of us. Do you recommend us to take metformin, like maybe low dose, 500 milligrams, even if you don't have diabetes, especially if it's a borderline? I, I, as an internist, I do value metformin quite a bit. It is a life savior in a lot of patients. The way it acts at this time is by helping with the insulin resistance. As I mentioned earlier, insulin resistance is the number one problem that it leads to the other complications of diabetes, that is heart disease or stroke or peripheral vascular disease, or if they are having any amputations or any kidney disease, it's all causes the problem. So whether taking the metformin long-term, they did do some study and found out it prevents the colon cancers as well as aging problems. And uh, I forgot the details, but at least the five, six aspects of a uh, healthcare get, it gets improved by metformin. But it is a medicine that needs to be cautiously taken because it can cause lactic acidosis. If lactic acidosis, higher levels can shut down the kidneys and they may die or end up on dialysis. So uh, without getting screened with their lactic acid levels, whether their body is able to handle it or not, uh, I would recommend to get um, screened by their physician, having a talk with them, have that contract or a rapport with the physician. So they check their uh, BMP uh, blood test and can start them. And in the past, it was not approved for pre-diabetes or borderline diabetes. Now uh, it is approved. It is approved for polycystic ovary disease to improve the infertility and certain conditions that are approved. In some of them are off-label uses. But I what I would recommend is do talk to your physician because it needs to be talked and discussed and gather their consent to um, know the re risks involved and the advantages uh, that they can uh, receive. I would yeah. recommend before metformin the diet and exercise. I think you might also heard from all the speakers today, 
our diet indian diet even though it is a, a, a plant based mostly it is not getting prepared well it is causing a lot of issues and our bmi needs to be low our cholesterol levels need to be means diet is needs to be dealt first and exercise to burn off the excess calories then medicines because metformin effect is a short term our body doesn't work after 2 3 months of metformin they a lot of them you know progress into real diabetes even though they are on metformin okay, those so are the points that come to me right away thank you thank you very much adhishe yeah. reddy garu i think i just want to improvise or maybe just to add to dr padma jagari's statement uh, i think david sinclair is the phd uh, from harvard has done sure. a fantastic regarding uh, research regarding uh, like uh, slowing of the aging so the way they described use of metformin is to decrease mtor basically this mtor molecule is decreased uh, with the exercise uh, use of metformin as well as with uh, intermittent fasting i think there is a lot of science behind it i think the the basis for recommending uh, metformin use is to decrease the mtor that way like reversing the aging process so i think that's the basis for him uh, yeah. i think we need to have like a lot more like a randomized control trials to really see and document this particular yeah. thing so i think they're talking about the ap genome working uh, you know kind of controlling mtor regulation this way Thank yeah you. absolutely absolutely that's good uh, good what point. is what is intermittent yeah. fasting i mentioned the yeah, but anyway uh, our time does not permit right now Uh, yeah. so thanks and i just want to say uh, my uh, just once say my video is gone so yeah i think a doctor uh, Ra- ramirey digar will conclude this uh, yeah. okay. webinar go ahead uh, ramirey yeah thanks and thanks ashish redigaru and thanks uh, all the wonderful speakers it's, it's definitely on behalf of nata we sincerely thank everybody for participating and giving uh, uh your your experience to our uh, community it's it's more valuable what uh, uh, and uh, i just want to thank uh, superity makeup for uh, uh, taking care of all the uh, things behind the scene so zoom and all the technical work yeah thank you narendra digaru and uh, so all the team and uh, I sincerely thank uh, Apna Foundation, um, Pravin Sampath Garu and Bhavan Andreti Garu and also RP team uh, for joining and uh, giving your valuable suggestions. Uh, thank you, Andy. Thank you to all the speakers and especially uh, for taking care of the live streaming and all. Lalesh from Mana TV. And uh, Sridhar Chilara Garu for, uh, from TV5. Uh, and mana tv uh thank you all for your support and uh, we'll we'll bring more and more updates in future also then thanks again adishesh reddy garu for bringing this wonderful uh, uh, webinar th- thank you thank you all i'm ready and uh, subha reddy and narayan reddy without non doctors we couldn't have done it uh, so anyway i think um, we may have one one or two minutes i think since mohan brought up i think we are done with the with meeting anybody can adjourn but if anybody want to stay and want to hear about intermittent fasting either padmaja or bhavanand you want to comment briefly then we can everybody intermittent, can... intermittent we will end with the intermittent fasting yeah that's right that's right yeah yeah okay so bhavanand so, yeah, yes, yes. go for it yeah yes I, i think i think 